When something really triggers you, it's always because you're buying into it. There's a self-judgment there. So, you know, someone's rude to you. One person can be rude to you and you brush it off as that person's just rude. Another person's rude to you and you get really pissed. It's because you're buying in on some level to what that person is judging you for. So you're judging yourself for it. I'm Andy Petronic, the co-founder of the Whole Life Challenge, the inspirational game that helps thousands of people around the globe take action each day to improve their health, fitness, and well-being. Join me each week on the Andy Petronic Podcast for interviews with guests that will help give you ideas, get inspired, and take action toward being the best and healthiest version of yourself you can be. Welcome, welcome, welcome. It's Andy, and I'm here with episode number 138 of the Andy Petronic Podcast. My guest today is Kristen McDermott. She is a marriage and family counselor, and her specialty is in resilience. She's been doing this work for quite a long time. She's a mom. She's a very normal person, a very relatable and her insights are amazingly simple. She brings some really incredibly valuable uh, exercises and skills you can literally take away right from the podcast. It's it's really good stuff. You're going to really love it. But more on that in a sec. But uh, I wanted to share with you a quick story that uh, took place over the last week. I was I didn't put up an episode last week because I got overwhelmed by preparing last minute preparations to go be a speaker at the Paleo FX convention, which was in Austin every year. It's really the place that everyone that's a who's who in the paleo world goes to speak and to put up all their products and uh, share what they've been up to. And uh, I was a speaker this year. I was on a panel with Mark Sisson, Ben Greenfield, Joe DiStefano, um, Brad Kearns on endurance racing and training and how it's changed, how the, the context of endurance training has changed over the past 10 years and that's kind of gotten a bad rap and, and how to actually, if you want to do endurance, how to do it. And it was a great panel, but what stressed me out and what the reason for the podcast not going up last week was uh, I had not prepared a talk because I was a backup speaker and I thought, well, I'm a backup speaker. Why don't I really need to prepare? And that's just silly. Of course I need to prepare because what if they ask me to speak? I, I can't go up there and just piddle, you know, twiddle my thumbs. So I already had a talk in mind, and um, but I hadn't prepared, and I started working on it and working on it and working on it. And my secret strategy with all this was maybe, probably, you're going to make it through the weekend without ever being called upon to speak. So you get the advantage of having volunteered. You get to feel good and you know all the, all the pluses of having volunteered to be a backup speaker. I get to prepare to be a speaker, but I don't actually, actually have to give my talk which fed very nicely into my story uh, around, I can't do it. I'm not good enough. I don't really have anything important to share with the world. And I really shouldn't be up here anyway. So all that worked really well for me. Uh, that was until Saturday afternoon at the convention when I'm, I'm literally on the convention floor telling someone, ah, you know, I was a backup speaker, but I don't think they're going to call on me. It's Saturday afternoon. There, there's really not much time left in the convention. And uh, tap, tap, tap. You're Andy Petronic. Oh, great. Uh, you, we need you to speak. You got 10 minutes. Meet me at stage five. And <laughs> I think all the blood rushed out of my head. Uh, I turned white as a ghost. And then I just got down to business. And uh, it, it was not easy um, in any stretch of the imagination. I don't know that I'd ever volunteer to be a backup speaker again because you're the understudy. You're, you're not on the schedule. You're not on the program. Nobody knows you're speaking. You haven't had time to announce it. You know, the benefit is nobody's expecting you to really do much because you're not on the schedule. But that's also the downside of that, you know, and uh, it was quite uncomfortable you know a few people got up and left when they found out that the speaker that they were there to see uh, wasn't going to be there and 
But, you know, it was my first real public speaking engagement. I mean, I've spoke to a lot of groups before, but never in an, envir- in an environment like that. And, uh, you know, I didn't, I didn't falter in the first 10 minutes. I started, it took me about 10 minutes to feel somewhat comfortable. And I only had 20 minutes, by the way, my talk was actually like 30 or 40 minutes. So I had to do a lot of scrambling to figure that out. So that's my big story for this week. I'm committed to, uh, keeping this, these introductions short. So I'm going to move into another piece mobility 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 it's a it's a fancy word for stretching i published one of my whole life living room whole life challenge living room workouts uh at the beginning of this whole life challenge it was episode number 24 on youtube if you do andy patronic search for andy patronic living room workout number 24 it is a mobility routine that i've been doing i'd say five days a week since the start of the whole life challenge and it is you know, look, when I posted it as my um, mobility routine, it, it was, but I'd only done it probably five times up until that point. It, it is really, really, really effective. So I highly recommend you go out there and check it out and watch it and, you know, modify it, tweak it, write down all the notes and don't watch it again. It's I, you know, I'm not trying to promote necessarily the video, although I've been doing it as a follow along with video with my son and it works really well for both of us. But um, yeah, so there you have it. And last but not least, this is actually the most important part of the intro. I want to introduce my guest, Krista McDermott. She is remarkable in the, her, her ability to communicate incredibly simply what it means to be resilient. And she shares probably the biggest takeaways I got from the episode. And I put all this in the show notes is some very simple exercises to do to become more self-aware of your actions so that you can actually become more resilient. She's actually done some studies uh, with groups of women Um, some who have been terminally ill cancer patients around utilizing her techniques and utilizing her program to find out if their life has improved. And in each of the studies, there have been massive gains, massive improvement in their, um, in how they're feeling. And, and, you know, it's funny, one of the jokes we made during the podcast was how, it wasn't really a joke, but it was kind of serious. It was, you know, gosh, it would be so valuable for people to have cancer temporarily, not knowing it's temporary. And uh, because of the value that you can get from the insights that that affords if you work through your issues and your relationship to death and whatnot. Anyway, I don't want to talk too much about it now because we go way into it in the podcast. Enjoy this one. Um, here we go. Kristen McDermott, welcome to the podcast. Thank you so much for having me. Why do I feel like it's deja vu? <laughs> All over again. <laughs> Jesus. <laughs> so I got to share this. Uh, we just recorded about the first 20 minutes of the podcast and the recorder was on pause. <laughs> Jeez Louise. I'm so glad I noticed before we got to an hour and a half. I'm really glad. Um, but uh, we get to do it again. <laughs> Groundhog Day. <laughs> I mean, uh, Kristen's expertise is in resilience. And I just said, well, we'll see how resilient <laughs> you will are. We'll see if I can hold it together. <laughs> this is a test. <laughs> so, um, welcome. It's Thank really, you. it actually really is good to have Thank you. Thank you. Um, uh, you know, it's always awesome when my, some of the, my favorite people in the world refer to me, refer me people who, uh, I meet because they're great friends with them. Um, which you came from my friend Jocelyn and, uh, and she helped me write a book. So we know each other well and she, really well, she yeah. got inside my head and I just, it was so magical to me that someone could get to know me in the way I think and, mm-hmm. and be so helpful to that process. So I love and adore her. <laughs> was, was she able to do it without too much snark? Well, I sort of like the snark. <laughs> I appreciate she the snark. She is notoriously snarky. <laughs> But that's good. It is good. It, 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 it keeps is totally you from good. taking yourself too seriously, right? Absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. <laughs> um, 
And the thing you worked on was a book about resiliency. That's right. Right. Mm-hmm. So um, I know you just did this, <laughs> uh, which is give us your story. My life in a nutshell. Yes. But, you know, uh, yeah. So how did you get started in this work? You know, one of the things I, actually in the last bit that, that I was going to ask you is how did you start as a man, marriage and family counselor before you got into the resiliency world? Like what? What, um, how'd you get started in this business to begin with? That was actually a turning point moment for me. That was, I always say that was the first original thought I ever had. I which, went to, which was the first original to, thought? to go back to school to become a marriage and family therapist. Oh. I was just a, one of those kind of rule follower, people pleaser, made mm. straight A. I mean, this is not a good thing. You know what I mean? Like yeah, I was yeah, just, yeah. Yep. I just did what you did. I went to prep school and then I went to a great college. Which is I, where, where was all this? Did that you? was all in Knoxville, Tennessee. Okay, and then it. I went to Duke mm-hmm. and uh, which I loved. I love Duke and that was one of the greatest experiences of my life. And when I got out of there, I kind of was programmed, not because of anyone's fault, but my own, but it was like doctor, lawyer, Indian chief, right? Like Mm -hmm. maybe investment banker, lawyer, these are the things that you did. And so... Was that something you just learned from culturally or from your family or was was there pressure from your family to do that? No, none of it is my family. I have the greatest parents ever. Everyone I know wants to be adopted by my parents. No, it was just me like thinking that I was supposed to just rise to whatever the challenge was and just Mm -hmm. do it well. And I... And... I don't know. I just always was looking for the next hoop that I was supposed to jump through. And again, this is all me. No one, no one, you know, I just was a perfectionist, which is a bad, bad thing to be. (laughs) Did you learn that from any sports? Did you play? No, uh, I was kind of, um, I was kind of good at a bunch of sports, but not great at any. Uh Um, I just, you know, and I was, I was good at getting good grades. And so I got out of college and I got into business school and law school, which, you know, thank God. God, I didn't do either of those because I it just wasn't where my heart would have been, but I would have done it, and then I might have felt like I needed to yeah, keep doing that. that. Yep. And then um, the first rebellious thing I ever did was marry my husband, who's probably going <laughs> to listen to this really? and <laughs> not be happy. Really? No, but, um, well, did I you mean, meet him I, in college? Did you meet I him met him being a ski bum in Aspen. I went wow. to be a ski bum from that one winter yep, and um, yep. just fell in love and did that thing you're not supposed to do, which was, is follow a boy. Was he a ski bum too? He was a ski bum the year before, and ah. he had been one of those rare people who just did it for one winter, and then he came out to L.A. to um, wow. you know, seek his fame and fortune, and yep. all his friends were my friends back in Aspen. And um, so I came and moved to L.A. and you know, moved in with an actor who was marginally employed at the time wow. <laughs> and didn't go to business school or law school, and my parents were like, wait – you're the good kid. What's happening? What? We don't even know. <laughs> right. don't even know Who have you become? What, to say. what happened in Aspen? And uh, and exactly. And so then I found myself in LA. And how but, did you? Wait, I got to go back. How did you make the decision to go to Aspen? Because that seems like a big jump for somebody who's focused on career and their performance. And, I mean, that's a good point. I um, I don't know. For some reason, that was easy. That just seemed like my parents had a house there, and so it was uh, just. I thought like one winter being a ski bum that just sounds like. And so I, we still living I knew that there, I could go um, to business school, law school after that. Yep, and so yep. I just was like, I worked really hard in college. I get to go have a fun. Were they supporting you? <laughs> yeah, they're. I'm oh, telling you, they're okay. great. <laughs> <laughs> that could be great. That could not be great. Yeah. But it just depends. <laughs> Obviously, you came out great. So. Yeah. Thanks. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So then I found myself in LA, but not. Um, one of those people who was, you know, born to tell a story, mm-hmm. who I admire so much, but um, also, you know, oh, so the movie business, well, that sounds interesting, let's let's see. And so I found myself kind of 10 years bouncing around the movie business, trying to find myself and not... You were trying to be in the movie mu- Not the on the behind the scenes, not oh, ever, okay. you know, in front of the camera, but just, uh-huh. you know, you're here. So I thought, you know, I did like film distribution for a while and production and whatever, but it was never really my thing. And then I got pregnant with my first child. Mm-hmm. And that first year of his life was the first year I ever didn't work. And it was the hardest thing I've ever done. And mm-hmm. and I would say the best, but really the hardest. I mean, I love my children. I love him. But it was really hard to stay yep. home all day and not have the intellectual stimulation and just the adult conversation and all those things. So I knew I wanted to work. But then I realized it needed to mean something to me. Mm-hmm. You know, it really needed to be something that you know, was going to shape my life that I could pour my heart into. And so I would sit for hours and just make these lists of what am I good at? What do other people think I'm good at? What do I enjoy? What do, you know, I I just couldn't figure out what it was. And finally, it was just staring me in the face. But I had no paradigm for being a therapist. I mean, from Tennessee, back then, no one went to therapy, no one was a therapist. Like, it was just, 
And even at Duke, like that was just this other thing. I mean, Tennessee is kind of we. So we went back to Nashville. Mm-hmm. My, my wife's in the mu- in the music business, mm-hmm. and um, it's uh, you know, I mean, mostly pickup trucks. There are gun racks. <laughs> no, that's not fair. There, there are, are gun those. racks in almost every <laughs> rear window of, a, yeah. of the pickup trucks. Um, I mean, I, look, I love Nashville. I absolutely love it back there, but it, it's south. I mean, it's different. It's really different. You know, I was kind of snotty growing up. I, when I, I always thought I had to get out of here. I thought it was so provincial. And I mm-hmm. look back now and I think it was a lovely way to grow up. I have Absolutely. to say, the quality of life. Yeah. And there, family, family values. Yeah. I mean, so one of our, uh, Julia's best friends is, um, she's also in the music business in Nashville. And, you know, they'll get together with friends like Randy, Randy Travis, or, <laughs> you know, Brooks and Dunn. Like, mm-hmm. they'll go over to their living room and they'll just start playing music and hanging out and singing and, you know, like, it's so not presumptuous mm-hmm. and they're so generous and welcoming and, um, it's people really, are it's, so nice when you go yeah, visit. Yeah, I mean, I forget what when I go visit my son in college back in the south. Mm-hmm. People are so friendly. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's a really cool environment, but it is it is different. You know the. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, it's different. Yeah, so I didn't have any paradigm for marriage and family therapy. I just had this this sense that it would be something that would be really interesting to me. What did you major in in college? History and German. Oh, so you, just, you were set up to be a student, basically. <laughs> just exactly. Right. Nothing really useful. Right. Um, Why German? Because uh, I spent the first three years of my life there. My dad oh. was drafted. He was a doctor, so he got to go to Germany, and, and so there was really not a lot to do except yep. for to kind yep. of travel around. So they, mm-hmm. you know, I spent the first years of my life there, and I learned to speak German, and my, my parents didn't. But um, So then I just took it all the way from eighth grade through high school through... It's funny, that, that was my language, too, in, oh, really? in, in high school. And I, I, I wish I had done Spanish. I mean, like, I live in the I world know. of Spanish. Yeah. Um, but uh, I quickly forgot. Like, I barely... You forget all the vocabulary because you don't use it. Don't use it at all. Yeah. Right. right. So, yeah. Yeah. Do you, use, do you still speak German? I mean, I could, I guess, if I went. I mean, every once in a while, someone will come into my life, and I'll try it out a little. But Sprechen Sie Deutsch. If you'd go there and be immersed for <laughs> yeah, a week that, or two, we'd would, remember. Right, totally. But, yeah. At least some. <laughs> So yeah, yeah, yeah. It's not that useful of a right. language, <laughs> right? It, well, it's such a little area of the world that speaks it. You know, I like, know. Spanish seems to be taken over. So yeah. Um. So anyway, so uh, you decided at that point you were going to go back to school and yeah, but a and it was a big thing because I had this infant and the idea of going back to school at that point I'd been out of college for ten years. It's now, a did long you time. were you taking care of all the home responsibilities at home? Like, did you have? Yeah. Yeah. Pretty. I mean, yeah. My husband would leave and go to his job, and I was, which is maybe why I didn't love that paradigm. Mm-hmm. <laughs> I mean, it's hard. Uh, absolutely. And um, you know, you get trapped in the house with no food, but the kids asleep, so you don't want to wake them up. <laughs> Just, right. What do you do? Well, all that stuff. I remember. I mean, I remember that very well. From you know, my wife was a working mom, and uh, those first that first year was really hard. It is the really first hard. Year was really hard. Yeah. And then finally, when we decided it, when he was two and a half, so we had a nanny, but then. Um, when he was two and a half, she's like, okay, we're preschool. We're going to preschool. Mm-hmm. And that was a hard decision because mm-hmm. is he too young for preschool? Is he, you know, God, he seems really, really little. But he met one of his best friends who's still his best friend from like in life. Oh, that's great. In preschool. And um, yeah, no regrets. It's all good. Yeah. So, so yeah. So then I had to break it to my husband that I was, <laughs> <laughs> he was like marriage and family therapy. Why? And I was like, well, did you, you read know. a book? Like, what gave you the? I, you know, to be honest, and Michael, it, we've been through a lot. We've been like married for twenty six years almost, so mm-hmm. he would be okay with me saying this. But you know, we were at a time in our marriage where we had been through some of those times. One of those times when it's like, wait, hold on, and we don't have a lot of tools. Like, we didn't have a lot of tools for dealing with the stuff that if you're going to stay married to someone for decades, you need them. Mm-hmm. And I was curious. I, I, I thought there's got to be a way to help people through this. So it just, because I knew I was going to stay married mm-hmm. and I knew that there had to be a better way to deal with the really hard stuff that comes up right. in a marriage. It just called to me. I've just always been really interested in what goes on in people's heads And like that drives their behavior. But I just didn't know I was. I just didn't. And all of a sudden, when I really thought about it, it just, just, you know how those things in your life, they just, you just know, you can Mm -hmm. feel it in your body. Yep. And I just knew. And he was like, 
you're going back to school for this? And I was like, yeah. And I found this program where I could go one day a week. So I went on Tuesday mornings from 7 a.m. to 10 p.m. And then I could still be a mom and get all my homework done. Physically, I went to a place for that whole day. And Uh then the rest of the time, you had the whole time to do your homework and all that. And I loved it. I just loved it. I thought it was just that it was so much fun to be learning something that felt like a calling. Now, when you when you learned in this, were you, were you bringing parts of your life into the things you were learning and dealing with things going on for you? Or was it more you were studying about the way to be a therapist? And I were- think if you don't bring your stuff into it and work through your stuff, you're missing the point. Like this is, it's not, right. how can you really help someone else in the like, gut-wrenching stuff that's theirs if you haven't walked that walk if you haven't like cleaned up your own house right right. and gotten your own awareness of what what drives you and where are your blind spots and where Mm -hmm. you know i mean yeah i think you you have to do your own work and there was definitely stuff about my own marriage that i wanted to like what was mine like what Mm -hmm. did i need to own in mine because Mm -hmm. i've always believed in not being a victim so, which means you have to take responsibility for your half, mm-hmm. and it's hard Wait, in only, marriages. Only half. <laughs> 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 hmm, yeah, no, I'm not taking responsibility for my husband's half. <laughs> I'm not doing that. I didn't know there were halves. I'm like, I, I thought full responsibility was 100 uh, percent of your stuff. You got to be able to separate it out, right? Well, yeah, because but- I mean, I think sometimes people come to couples counseling, and I see it as there really is there are like three piles of things to work on. There's yours, there's the other person's, and there's this the Venn diagram. There's the stuff in the middle. Right, right. But some of it really is, you need to go away and work on your stuff. Yep, yep. You know? Yep. And then come back, and you can do the the stuff that's the joint stuff. Sure, right. Yeah. So, um, okay, so you became a therapist. Yep. And you had more kids. And I, I did, and I liked that I, I thought I would just do the therapy thing because it's a nice lifestyle you can schedule your time when you Mm -hmm. want and still be a mom and have good conversations and help people and it's really meaningful and that was my life and then something happened and and, and (laughs) then i met this woman who uh just asked me to come and run a cancer support group in the hospital you were were still living in la so i was living in aspen at the time so we actually so i we were just in aspen for that or i was there for that one winter Mm -hmm. being a ski bum and then moved out to la and we were here for 12 years and then when it was time actually to go for my oldest to go to preschool um i just realized that i didn't like having no family around like it's hard to have kids and no family no emergency people yep yep and so we thought well where could we move and i didn't want to move back to tennessee and he's from upstate new york so i didn't want to go there either and neither did he so we what we were like. Do people really live in Aspen? Where's Could he we, from in New, upstate New York? He's from Lake Placid. Oh wow! Because I went to school in Rochester, New York. So oh. I'm very familiar with upstate. Yeah, now, so he's he went way, to Northwood. He's way upstate. Up, yeah, upstate. Way. He's yeah. almost Canada. We were. I was almost Canada, but Toronto. Oh like okay. Niagara Falls. Yeah, we're close yeah. To Buffalo and Niagara Falls. It's nice up there, except for it's cold. It's cold. The time. <laughs> cold and snow. I mean, there was one period of time at I think my junior year where. We had snow every day for like, I don't know, we were counting like 60 days in a row. It's crazy. Like even flurries. We but counted good a little. ski snow? I mean, if you can use there's it. No bump. There's no bump. Yeah, there's see no where little... he is, there was a mountain. But yeah, it's it was great. mostly ice. And that's where they had the Olympics in. Yeah. When was that? 1980, because he was there. That was the Miracle on Ice. Right. Yeah. Oh, God. It's one of my favorite <laughs> movies of all time. Yeah. Favorite so stories good. of all time. Yeah. Yeah. So, I forgot what we were saying before we're that. We were talking about so, Aspen. Oh, yeah. We so, move. so we, we decided to move to Aspen because my parents had had a house there. So, I thought, well, I wonder if we go there, if we can get my parents to be there most of the time. Mm-hmm. And we ended up, for the nine years we were there, we ended up having my parents and two of my three brothers there for the whole time, which was just, wow. so it was just, wow. it really is an idyllic place to live. I mean, yeah. it, it, yeah. you know, the, your traffic is like a five minute. <laughs> Like, right, right. if you're delayed one minute in your five-minute drive, <laughs> you're unhappy about it. <laughs> right. It's just so easy. It's lovely. But um, but it's not the real world. <laughs> right, right. But then again, neither is L.A. in some ways. No, you're right. I yeah. Mean, what is the real world? I mean, That's I a really know. weird question. Yeah, you're right. It's whatever. It's whatever's going on in our head. I mean, that's Right, like, exactly. That's reality for us, right? Yeah. So, so that's where. So I was invited to run a support group at this um, Aspen Valley Hospital, and I really was reluctant to do that. I felt like it would be, as you would imagine, that it would be just just hard, mm-hmm. just depressing, really. And I found that she convinced me to just come and just, just see what she did. And um, so I did. And I found that it was actually 
so much more inspiring than depressing. It was really, it was, it was actually, I mean, yes, there were some sad times, but it was just so much more meaningful. Mm. And, um, you know, the people there are really looking for just some way to feel better. It's so disruptive, the cancer experience. It's disruptive of what's going on in your head. You have so many decisions to make. You have to keep your whole regular life together. You have to still be, you know, a mom and a wife or a husband or whatever those things are and still now become an expert in your own medical care right. and your right. own healing and or or think about those really hard things like the possibility of dying. I mean, there's just so much. And so, and then I always laugh and say that in couples counseling, there's always one person who doesn't want to be there. Usually someone got dragged there. And mm-hmm. so there's just so much... Um, Usually I say not a good word. Resistance is a good word for sure, right, <laughs> in the right. room, you know, um, or maybe not even truthfulness. And so um, I just found it such meaningful work. And I also really liked the idea that it was tools-based and skills-based. Like what people were wanting from me, they were wanting skills for like relaxing and sleeping and making decisions and kind of putting things out of their mind and, or, you know, communicating, which is really where, that's where I just was always drawn. I never liked the idea of people coming to me forever and kind of this indefinite conversation, mm-hmm. which, as I said before, I think there is real value in that. It's just for me, I wanted people to just come, learn what I knew, and then not need me. I think that there doesn't have to be this kind of magic black box of what a therapist knows Mm -hmm. that you have to kind of come forever for pay forever for that you should be able to learn those things and then be your own best advocate and sometimes we all need people to check in with i'm not saying that but i just think there's that there's this idea of that you can teach people skills and help them practice and then they can do it themselves it's so funny you say that because that was my impetus um for building the programs that i did as a trainer I was very much of the same mindset that you looked at these people that were going to the same trainer year after year, decade after decade, Mm -hmm. and you didn't see any differences. You didn't see any changes. They Mm -hmm. became crutches. They became, you know, like you're taking your dog for a walk. Okay, it's time to go here. It's time to go there. People checked out. People not really paying attention to what they were doing. And I always was like, I want my clients to come to me, learn what they need to learn, and then move on. Mm -hmm. And like almost exactly exactly what you're saying. Um, Yeah. That to me was exciting. That to me, like I never wanted to uh, lose clients. I mean, it's not that I like had some strange business desire to get rid of them. (laughs) but 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 I always thought it was really interesting if your impetus in business is to keep your clients forever, do you really want them to get better? Right. Like how much better do you want them to get? Do you want them to really fully get better and take responsibility for everything? Well, no, because then they don't need you anymore. Right. You know, so it but was that always dependence a dependence felt yucky. to Absolutely. Me. Yeah. I totally relate yeah. to that. Yeah. I'm like, that's the last thing I want. So, uh, I gotta say one thing. It's so funny that you just talked about the kind of the CrossFit thing too, or that piece, because I was telling my 20 year old son, what I was coming to do right as I was getting out of the car. Mm -hmm. He was like, you got to tell him what I was telling you the other day. It's like the CrossFit thing where you, you can just go in and look at the workout of the day and then you're on your own to do it, but you don't have to like think or go to someone else. And it's like always changing. He was like, it's the best model. It was just so funny because he was just saying like, he's frustrated because he doesn't have that at college. Yeah, And then he's like, what am I going to do? It's great. Well, it's interesting because it's great for a 20 year old. Uh, especially a 20 year old who knows how to move, Mm -hmm. who doesn't need a lot of coaching, who doesn't need a lot of um, help. But for everybody else out there that's not 20 or 25, Mm -hmm. um, I don't think that's really the best approach for CrossFit because it's hard and it's complicated and it requires, it's complex movement that can actually hurt you. Yeah. And um, so like coaching, I think is probably the most important thing you can do with CrossFit until you know how to move, mm-hmm. until you know how to feel it yourself. So you don't even need a mirror to know whether your back is arched or flat or rounded. Um, like really, really, really important. And for 20 year olds, they're not really interested in that. They want the, and I think it's great for that too. You mm-hmm. know, so. But this is a good metaphor going back to what we were talking about because that's yeah. how I feel about skills training instead of counseling. 
Like right. that's, it's, right. it's that. Learn so the that skills. you can feel it. Yeah. Like, and you know what question to ask yourself. Right. Because every it's all about asking yourself the right question. Because your therapist doesn't move in with you. It's not like they're there when an argument <laughs> right. happens and say, okay, right. let's break it up here. Ding right. the bell and everybody your corners. And like, by I, the way, I kind of wish forget. that was the case. <laughs> well, I, I, it's actually funny that you say this because my model when I work with people one on one is actually that we're going to do this for a short period of time, like three months. But I'm actually going to, you want me in your head. I'm going to be in your daily life. Mm -hmm. So we're going to have a check-in. It's not going to take more than 15 minutes of your time or my time every day. And it's mostly going to be in writing. But we are going to talk about like that day. Like what was the trigger? What did you do? What could you have done? Because they are habits that you want to create. And so I really do like working that way. We're like, if you're going to do this with me, let me in in your head. Like let me be there in your daily life so that you can start to think about your stuff the way I That's a really interesting approach. You know, like 15-minute conversations. Mm -hmm. So you don't have to do an hour and a half, you know, deep. I mean, you have those two, but I think in between. Yeah. That's cool. Yeah. I like that. Because you need to become, you just need to become self-aware of the process. Well, you need pattern pattern interrupts. That's right. You know, and if you don't, those patterns, we've greased the groove for, you know, I mean, Mm -hmm. heck, I'm 50 years old. So for five decades, I've greased certain grooves that I'm not even conscious of. Well, especially when it comes to the biggest thing I think that changes people's lives is looking at their beliefs, right? And Mm -hmm. our beliefs, especially those really important, like those core beliefs about ourselves, Mm -hmm. they run our lives, they drive our behavior, but to a large extent, they're invisible to us, right? Because we've just been taking them for granted as true for so long. Mm -hmm. So... I'm not good at this or I'm not whatever it is. We don't even we don't even look at them. And so and the way I think of beliefs is like your beliefs are like this matrix or like this goggles that you put on. So when you look out in the world, you only see evidence for the beliefs you already have. Right. You literally like look through the crap. You don't even see the other stuff because you just that's just how our mind works. Well, our mind can't possibly contain it, they, it filters. It has it, to. It has to because right. of the billions of information your eyes can see or your brain can't process all that information. So it just right. filters so out you have the to stuff make you don't want to see. So you make right. it and then you carry this around with you and a lot of it doesn't serve you. Yep. So going through that process of looking at like, what is driving this decision I'm making? Oh, wow. There's this whole underlying belief that like, I'll never find better. So like... It's just fascinating and it's yeah. so helpful, but you got to be in your daily life, like with that yeah. level of self awareness to unhook from that stuff. So, um, you, you were helping, if back to your story, you were helping cancer. Well, they weren't survivors, they're in the process, in the they process, were, and their loved ones. So, when they would come right. in and get chemo for, you know, it's four, six, seven hours at a time. They're just hooked up, kind of trapped in that chair. Mm-hmm. And so I would go in, and there was another woman, and um, you know, we separately, but, and we would go in and just kind of have conversations and just kind of see like what was going on. And before we developed our curriculum, we just were noticing that some people were doing really well, and others were doing not well at all. Mm-hmm. And I just started wondering, like, what is it about this group of people? Some people just, they didn't, they hadn't gone to therapy. They hadn't learned this in school anywhere. But something about the way they thought about their cancer made them resilient. It made them strong. It made them positive. And I don't love the word positive because I don't mean that you're supposed to put your head in the sand and just pretend. But like, it made them able to face it realistically and figure out what they could do and then be okay and like be present in their lives Whereas other people were really thrown for a loop, which is totally understandable because it is just such a disruptive thing. So I just became really curious. Like, was the was the first group thrown for a loop too? I mean, everybody's thrown. Everybody's for a loop, thrown they? for a loop, and it certainly looks different for everyone. But you see people like what you were just talking about. How like we sort through everything, and then we make, then we we sort of decide uh-huh. how we talk about it. We, we, we make meaning of it. Yep. And that happens pretty quickly. You hear the way people talk pretty quickly. So you can hear in someone's talking about their diagnosis, like more than just what's happening today. You can hear about what they're believing about their future. You can hear about what, what they believed about their past. There's so much in how we talk about it. And mm-hmm. so that you sort of solidify your story. And then all of a sudden, that's the story that everyone is expecting from you. And it's kind of hard to change, too, because mm-hmm. everyone starts kind of 
going down that path. And so I would just hear people, you could tell, like these are the people who are gonna, they're gonna rally, they're not gonna accept, you know, their, ki- their friends treating them differently. They're gonna, this is what they want. They, they're gonna put the resources in place that they need. Whatever it was, it just was a, it was just a way that people had of knowing what they could control and taking control of their situation and their outlook. I mean, again, I was curious, like how do you know how to do that? Like, right. why do you right. do that? Where did you get that? Did they have some common commonalities? Like, did they grow up in a certain part of the country? Did they? So, no. What I what I would say is what came out of our research was we discovered these seven pillars. And so, one of them, the one that I'm thinking of now, is support. And that was a common one. Like, mm. for people who had really good support, people who they could be, you know, honest with, and they and people who were able to ask for help and allow themselves to be helped. You know, that was that's like one of seven pillars. There right. were there was a cluster around that. There's a cluster one of them is about hope, which is really just about how do you think about things? Like do you tend to think that you are empowered and you know how to find what's in your control and find a way to kind of make a claim on doing something for yourself or are you not that so that was really like a cognitive behavioral kind of piece of it so hope the way i hear hope well you could interpret hope a lot of ways I yeah think, but um what you're saying is more like an ownership level of hope rather than a i hope this happens totally it's abs it's, it's like i would say it's about um like realistic optimism. So the realistic right. part is that I get, like I'm aware of what my doctors are telling me and I'm aware of the choices I've ma- I'm making. So I'm going to do everything that's in my control to take care of myself. Mm-hmm. And then I'm going to do some things that aren't about my cancer. Then I'm going to do these other things for myself because I'm aware that like my family's important to me. My other, So you're, they're going to, they just like think about realistically they can face their fears Mm -hmm. but also put things kind of in a box when they need to right like they're in control of how much they think about those things Uh um you know one of the things that i think of when i think about hope is that facing your fear usually the biggest fear people have is about death and dying and I mean, uh, uh, and it's totally understandable because it, like we don't even our brains don't even know what to do with that whole concept. And so, you know, when I would ask people about that fear, sometimes people would look at me like I was crazy. Like, well, I would say, you know, so are, tell me about, you know, are you afraid of dying? And they would be like, of course, I'm afraid of dying, which I totally understand. But then I would say, well, are you willing to dig into that a little bit? Because I find that the people who can face that find so much peace on the other side. Mm. And some people don't want to go there because they feel like facing that fear means giving up. Like just even to name it and say it out loud and make it a possibility means they're giving up hope. Yeah. But my thing is, if you're willing to look at it, fear of dying can be about so many different things. It's funny because as you're talking about it, I'm starting to think, I'm, I was starting to ask myself that question. Mm-hmm. And um, what came up for me almost immediately was just sadness. Mm-hmm. Like, I, I don't know that I'm afraid. I, I could be. I'm, I'm gonna mm-hmm. just put it out there. I could be, but I'd just be sad that I would miss my son growing up, and yep. I'd miss my later years of my life. I'd miss my retirement. I'd miss my, you know, I don't know. I don't, <laughs> I'd miss sitting around the, you know, sitting on the porch watching the world go by. You know. Um, so it's your fear is connecting to you to what matters to you, like what gives your life meaning and for who you love and. That's the beautiful thing about it, because then you can go and say, well, am I, do, am I living my life every right, day right, in alignment right. with what I value? Right. And you probably are, because I know a little bit about you, you know, but it, that's, that's where there's a benefit in going through that process. Because you really start to identify what's important. What is if important. You, if you've never thought about it. Before. And you have a choice every day. You have a lot of choices every day. Right. And no matter how many days you have left, you have a lot of choices every day to live your life in alignment with what matters to you. Mm-hmm. So that's the beautiful, but yes, you're going to go through and still be left with the sadness because that's where I am too. Like there's just, there's no way to get rid of the sadness, but that tells us that we're human and that we're lucky enough to love. Right. But. Like a dog doesn't have that. Right. I don't think. I mean, I don't think a dog looks at I mean, my dog would be really sad if I died, I think. No, I'm kidding. I I think you're right. (laughs) I mean, I'd like to think that. (laughs) (laughs) Um, But. 
it you know they don't have the they don't have the blessing or the curse right. of consciousness right yeah so that is what makes it that, that's what makes every day feel so important yeah right but then when you go to the other aspects of fear so you know other people are afraid of being in pain of what happens to your soul when you die yeah, right. of not having lived a life that mattered not you know so there's so, so and everyone's going to have a little bit different constellation of what those are and if you can be honest with yourself then you can do something about a lot of it you really can mm-hmm. and so you again you you can't take it all away all the sadness or even all the regret but you can at least know that you're doing everything you can. Well, you can start from that point yeah. forward and change mm-hmm. the way you approach your everyday life. Yep. Which, ch- I mean, it's transformative well, for it people. Well, mo- it moves you from, I mean, this is something we talk about a lot, is moving from thinking to acting. Yeah. To, to moving forward in life. Like the way out of almost anything is to start moving, mm-hmm. is to start going. Mm-hmm. It, is it the right direction, the wrong direction? Is it the right move or the wrong move? It doesn't, it doesn't matter because you can make another decision. Right. 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 You can always change course. Yep. I, for me, it's all about an action step. Mm-hmm. Can you find one action step with the information you have now? Right. And then tomorrow you might have different information so you can make a different decision. <clears throat> but I totally agree with you. Like just move. Do something that is a statement of who you are and who you want to be and where you're going. So did so did you find that that was part of the um, value of the program that you developed? I think for sure because um, that you know self-efficacy was one of the things that we studied, which mm-hmm. is just you know believing that you have the power in your own life to change, you know, to 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 take control and and have some control over your life. And so that was one of the things in our research that you know we have proven all along the way that we help with. So I think. I mean, there are there are a lot of things. I mean, like I said, we have seven pillars. And so, you know, one of them is balance. So it's just, you know, looking at how you get your own needs met. So needs are really a big thing for me, like being able to identify what your personal needs are. I think there's a whole kind of thing in our culture about like being needy and yeah, like right. having needs and and so I that word immediately popped into my head when you which said is why needs. I use that word right. I think it's really important and people don't even know that there are basic human needs that we're all not only are we need them to I mean you know you look at Maslow's hierarchy or whatever and yeah. it's like you know food shelter safety all those things but then as you go up the pyramid you need to feel like validated by others or at least that you can validate yourself and you know creative and freedom whatever they are and you get to decide mm-hmm. what's important to you but when you when you don't first identify what needs are important to you and they change over the course of your life right so as a college kid you need freedom and adventure and all those things and then now you need stability and Safety financial and, security and right, all those right. things <clears throat> but you know taking ownership of them and then deciding to make them a priority in your own life like that's probably one of the biggest things in my work with people with cancer just that just happened to be to stand out to me is that so many people I mean I will say it wasn't intentional but I ended up working more with women than men mm-hmm. again it just I think women are more um likely to say yes to something like this maybe early earlier adopters but um you know a lot of caregivers a lot of women who just put their needs second give mm-hmm. give 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 and this idea of saying you know what i'm going to actually make a few of my needs a priority in my own life is it's it's huge for yeah, people yeah, right. and so it does feel like wow there are action steps that i'm actually taking for me which gets to that thing of you know by the end of going through the program people felt like they would never wish it on themselves or anyone else but the process of just looking inside and looking at the decisions they were making made them feel better and stronger for having and they were they were glad for having gone through the experience because it stopped everything and got them to take a look like take stock right 
which a lot of times we don't. I mean, when are we going to do that? It's funny because at the beginning of the whole life challenge, we we talk about this thing. We we we've got we struggled with the name of what to call this. Like at one point we called it a snapshot, but it's not a snap. Like people th- related to that is like a picture, mm-hmm. which is one piece. Take a picture of your body and see where you are. But it it was really meant to be a take a snapshot of your life. Where are you in your life? Where are you in your relationship? Where are you in your career? Where are you in your body? Where are you in your fitness? Where are you in your flexibility? Where are you in your nutrition? And lay it out. Be willing to have have the courage to lay it out. Put it in front of you, you know, whether it's on one sheet of paper or it's on 20 sheets of paper. Lay out where you are because if you don't know where you are, it's the old adage, well, then how do you tell where you're going? Right. And have the courage to know where you are. And it's, it's, it's a hard, big, though, because people are disappointed in themselves. Absolutely. Right. Well, that's and that's about forgiveness and, mm-hmm. you know, kind of letting go of your need to be perfect or mm-hmm. right. Or, um, mm-hmm. But but this I feel the starting point is to be willing to actually look. Yeah. Where it's hard to look. Which is weirdly one of the strange things about the experience of something as disruptive as a diagnosis like that, that makes you stop. Right. And a lot of, right. you know, you don't work a lot of the time because you're having chemo. And so yep. you get that time, if you choose to, to really do exactly what you're saying. Right. Like, where am I? And what do I want this next chapter to look like? Right. And I think that's for all of us, like, totally agree with you. Just I mean, the if, time if to everybody that. could. This is going to sound crazy. It just popped into my head. If everybody could get cancer just temporarily, just to give them the... Just to shift the perspective. And then, and then they, okay, now then let's get rid of it. <laughs> okay, now we're good. But you, know, you, you wouldn't be able to know that you were going to be good because that would ruin the right. experience. Right. You'd have to think that this was it. Right. And, and then, you know, a month later, okay, surprise, that was just fake. That wasn't yeah. really... I mean, I, I don't want to meet... Ma- I'm not making light of no, that I at all. No, I know you're not. But there's a... There's a, there's a Um, there's a willingness of someone whose life depends on it mm-hmm. to look in, in as opposed to you're just going through normal life. You have to really want it. You have to really want to look to, you know, it takes a lot of willpower to get yourself to want to pull those rocks up. Yeah. But, when, but when you've got like death staring you, the grim reaper staring you in the face now, and I'm also saying this, I've never had it happen. So, maybe maybe i'm crazy maybe this is you know but it seems like that would be a way to i don't know make people take stock like you said yeah i mean i hear you and i was always reluctant to say like i would never say that to someone or even just start the conversation i'm saying that to you yeah yeah people are listening you know you can no, Whatever. no, but, the, but 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 I had it said to me so many times hmm. by the end of the process that, and then I would say, you know, I never wanted to say that, but I, I've, you're not alone. You know, so many people are are weirdly appreciative of this process when right, you do right. that. That, um, yeah, I mean, I'm I totally hear you. I'm with you on that. I mean, I I I have never had it either. So, um, you know, I may not be resilient at all when yeah, right. it really comes right. to it. But I have watched. Um, that the people who are who are interested in looking at their lives and looking at where you know where they can take some control mm-hmm. um, really find a path forward that feels good. Right. That right. Is, it's yeah. amazing. It's amazing when you think about that. How to feel good again, mm-hmm. especially if you're facing you know the end of your life. Mm-hmm. How do you, I get? That's amazing to me that that's possible. And it is. It obviously is because people do it all the time. Yeah. And you're helping them do it. Yeah, because that brings up for me too, you know, the because obviously I ended up doing a lot of grief work also mm-hmm. because not everyone does survive. And then there's also that choice to eventually choose to feel good mm-hmm. after you've lost someone, which feels like a betrayal a lot of the time. Right. Like, do you ever get to feel okay again? Right. And just the resilience of people to like go through the process. I think I said this the last time, but like resilience is really about being stronger and on the other side. And you've made, you've chosen to make meaning of your situation in a way that makes you feel 
stronger and and more empowered and maybe a better version of yourself. So a lot of people get through, and they make it, but they haven't gotten to what I would consider is that place where it's like, oh God, that changed me in a way that makes me feel like it had benefit to my life. Yeah, and so, right. you know, a lot of times it does take something big and disruptive right. for that to happen. My belief is that it doesn't have to. Like, my belief is that you can learn the same skills that help people in those really hard times. And that one, I think the misconceptions about like resilience training is that you, it's only really helps you when things get really bad. So I don't really want to learn resilience because I don't want to even think of things getting really bad. <laughs> right? right totally. But the truth is the same skills help you just to be in your daily life, mm. just to be more present and aware and just conscious and empowered which makes your relationships better. I mean, it helps everything that you do. Mm -hmm. And that's one of the things I think people don't quite get. Right. Well, because people, I mean, what, what is resilience? Usually resilience is just hearing someone tell their story of overcoming yeah, right. something bouncing, hard. Bouncing back. Which is something. inspiring when you're listening, yeah. but doesn't necessarily mean you know how to apply it to your own life. Right. So for me, resilience is really about starting with emotional intelligence. Starting with not, having to feel like you just become swept away by your emotions. The emotions are just these like free floating beasts that are going to pounce out of nowhere at any given time that you are aware of what causes your emotions and what effect they have on you, you know, behaviorally, physically, and then you c can actually take control of how you respond to your emotions, which then makes you, better able to tolerate other people's emotions mm -hmm. it gives you empathy so for me there that's how you build you build resilience by first building emotional intelligence and then there are resilience skills that you can learn as well i mean it's literally skills <laughs> like i could just teach you one thing at a time you can apply it to your life and it's not hard let's take a quick break and we'll be right back one of the greatest things I ever did was to allow myself the, what I thought was a luxury of getting meals delivered for my lunches. It turns out th that's really not much of a luxury. I mean, okay, so the meals from The Good Kitchen, which is where I get my meals delivered from, uh, they cost around somewhere between $12 and $15, depending on how many you get delivered at a time, what program you're on, which, you know, is definitely a little bit more expensive than lunches, but I find that the clarity and efficiency of my lunch and the quality of my lunch has gone up so dramatically since I allow myself to get these meals for me. It's it's a really important part of my day, actually, and they're delicious. They're Whole Life Challenge compliant, they're ketogenic, they're paleo, they're vegetarian. Or all, they, these are all options. And they're from sustain, su su sustainably sourced agricultural farms and are organic and, like I said, delicious. So I highly recommend checking them out, uh, thegoodkitchen.com. But if you go to this link, thegoodkitchen.com forward slash WLC, you'll get 15% off your first order. So check it out. I highly recommend it. And there you have it. Okay. So if you're going to teach me a skill, what's mm -hmm. the skill you could teach me? I always think the best one to teach is that there's always a thought behind your emotion. So if you can identify the thought that's causing the emotion, you, you can figure out what to do about it. So even though you can't change the fact that your boss has this unrealistic deadline and you're gonna, you feel like you're going to lose your job and your boss is just a complete jerk and you have no control over your boss's behavior. Right. But when you can identify that the thought is, I'm really not good enough at this job, or whatever it is. Is it a self-judgment thought? Not, usually, I mean, sometimes? usually. Like, that's, that's usually, it doesn't have to always be. The bigger ones, if you feel yourself more triggered, it is. Which is something that, we should just go there now, because you brought it up. Which okay. I, I think it's really f f such a cool thing to realize, that when something really triggers you, it's always because you're buying into it. There's a self-judgment there. So, you know, someone's rude to you. One person can be rude to you and you brush it off as that person's just rude. Mm -hmm. Another person's rude to you and you get really pissed. It's because you're buying in on some level 
to what that person is judging you for. So you're judging yourself for it. So it's almost a flip flop. Like if you're really triggered by somebody else, you've got to look at, okay, where do I believe? What yes. They said? And <laughs> when you, if you can do that, you right. can, it's like, it's the thing that will change your life the most. It right. gets me so excited <laughs> because right. it is right. so powerful. But we never do that because we're triggered and we always think it's the someone else. Right, <clears throat> right. But, but think about it. If you, you know, you have, I'm sure you have experiences where someone's just rude to you and it doesn't even affect you at all because you're just like, oh, that person must be having a bad day. Yeah, or they're just a jerk. Or they're just a jerk and you don't care. Yeah. But when you poke around at that thing that really you, And you. usually the people that can do that the best and trigger you the most mm-hmm. are the ones like... For me, it's my wife or my mom totally. or my sister or somebody that's really close to me, my best friend totally. or my business partner. You know, my business partner and I always talk, joke about how we're, we're, we're definitely in a relationship. Yeah. And we're definitely close. Mm-hmm. And so we're definitely in the, we're, we, we are like in working, in progress with one another in terms of our emotional mm-hmm. intelligence and mm-hmm. our ability to stay tight because we're constantly bumping up into, I can trigger him and he can trigger me. And it is, it's like a mirror. Yeah. I mean, I realized it when I, when this really was such an aha moment. That's what I love about my work is that I get to help people have these aha moments and then Mm -hmm. you just don't forget them. They're like in your body. Yeah. And I remember I was at this, it was actually at Harvard. I was at this training, this mind body training. And um, I, at the time, I think my oldest was like six or seven. And this is the person that I loved more than anyone in the world. It's my firstborn child. Mm -hmm. And I, I consider myself like a very even keeled person. I really am. Mm -hmm. But this thing would happen between us and like I would rage at him and I didn't understand like what is this? How can this little perfect little boy trigger this like... You mean in his presence? Yeah, like he he and I. Like he would do something and it would make me so crazy that I would just like be so mad and I never... I can't really picture you mad. I And I couldn't... (laughs) (laughs) Really? Well, that's the thing and this was like I don't... I'm, this is not who I was and that's why I'm saying it it's like the first time it really came out was it with this person who I love the most and he's so cute and precious like right, what is right. that and it really bothered me yeah right like what could matter so much and I realized when I did this work that I had this fear that something that was going on in his life was going to actually it wasn't anything horrible or nefarious or anything but that it was going to actually have a long term negative impact on him like uh-huh. I was actually worried that it would damage him this thing that was going on again like it's not nothing bad but just yeah 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 and when i dug into that if that if if something had been like messed him up emotionally i would have failed not just as a mother as a human i would have failed so every time i came up against that thing that i was worried about with him it triggered like my failure as a human it was so much bigger than just this dumb little thing he was going through and like when i Maybe he was a little older when I realized this. Maybe that maybe he was like nine. Because when I realized this, um, I just had a conversation with him. I was like, I figured it out. This thing that we do when we like go head to head, it's me. It's mine. And I, t- I mean, he, he could have this conversation. And we, we came up with this thing where <laughs> when I would get triggered like that, he would be like, Mom, you don't have to be perfect. This is like a little boy telling me this because that's what it was. It was like my whole perfectionism. Like I have to be such a good mom and such a good everything or I'm like a complete failure. And it was you like, have to and constantly it, prove yourself to the world. Right. right. And it, just, it changed. And he is the best, most well-adjusted, most awesome person ever. I mean, he's a 20-year-old boy who can talk about his stuff so well. But anyway, it was just fascinating because if you're willing to go, like where you're really scared what you're going to find, because mm-hmm. it's not pretty. That was not a pretty part of me. That's a really right. ugly, awful right. part of me. But if right. you're willing to go there, it will set you free. I sound like a preacher. <laughs> but it, <laughs> it Right, really right. Will. Yeah, no, I, I um it's funny because I've studied all this. You know, I've I've practiced all this. I went to the I went through a program at the University of Santa Monica. Oh, I love that. Which is a great program. So many program. of my instructors come from there because oh, really? they totally are in alignment with my curriculum. It, yeah. Yeah, it sounds like yeah. I mean exactly what you're talking about. And and yet I continue to struggle. I just I'm I I always joke with my wife. I'm just a really 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 slow study. <laughs> Please be patient with me, um, because it's so hard. You know, like I I don't know. Uh, you know, I guess it's just my curriculum, where I am. 
uh, it's like a super highway. It's like a light speed super highway that I forget all this training. I forget all the knowledge. I forget all the stuff. And it just, I was telling you before, it's kind of like the attract the tractor beam. I don't know. I'm a star Wars guy, but mm-hmm. like the tractor beam in star Wars, I just can't, I can't stop it. It's you like, mean like when you're triggered. Yeah. The pull, the pull in spite of all the knowledge and knowing I should stop and knowing to stop talking and knowing that I should clear myself. And it's always a trigger that is about me and a judgment about myself. It's still, I, you know, I'm probably better. I think you'd have to ask my wife um, Mm -hmm. because I'm probably not a great evaluator of whether I'm better. I think I am. Yeah, you are. Yeah, I think I am. Um, But it's still a struggle. It's, it's not, you know, but this is why it's good to have two people in the conversation because, right, right. Because no one thinks well when they're triggered. You right, just don't. Right, it's just right. a fact of life. Like when you're just totally flooded with emotion, you can't think well. And it's almost like a primal thing that you just have got to like go towards that aggression. But it's if like you can fight, have... It's like a fight or It fight. has to be. It yeah. feels like yeah. that. So if you have the other person who gets this and you've had a conversation about it, then you really can help each other not engage because I agree with you it's hard to walk away it's hard to take three drink breaths it's hard to do all those things but it serves you so well if you do Mm -hmm. just just don't I I mean the idea that you can have um, empowered thoughts when you're feeling so disempowered and out of control Mm -hmm. it doesn't make any sense like it, we we everything always matches, right? So our, I always think of it like a like a system of our thoughts and our emotions and our bodies, mm-hmm. where our emotions live, and then our behavior. They always match. So if you're feeling crappy emotions, you're gonna have crappy thoughts, and you're gonna feel crappy in your body, and you're gonna do dumb bad behaviors that right. don't serve you. Right. So if you can break the cycle, if you can just walk away from that thing is it is it most effective to stop the cycle through a physical action through an emotional action or through a thought action which is the i best think way to thoughts harder okay. in, in my mind thoughts harder i think that physical emotion and emotional you could make an argument for i mean physical to me if it's it to me feels like the most tangible mm-hmm. so that like, would be like walking out of the room. Like walk right? out of the room and like go. That just, see that for me, in f- if Julia does that, yes, knowing. Yes, but you have to have an agreement. It, yes, right. I get that. I get that. Right. Because that infuriates me to no one. It infuriates her when I do it. Right. So that, I mean. She'll my, follow me. My husband too. I'll he, follow her. <laughs> I, would, I would think I was being so great not to engage. And he's like, you're just condescending. I'm right. Like, no, I'm not engaging. That's right. why you have to have a beforehand. You have to have a plan. When you're both centered <laughs> and you're both, you both can yes. think clearly. But yeah. then, you know, I think like emotionally too, like sometimes like just a great song. I mean, it sounds silly, but like there's certain songs that just do it or like something funny or like calling a certain person who's just going to totally take your mind off of it. But you got to think of the situation and like for you, what is it? Like I, I I don't know. Like for me, I need to move my body. I just need to go move my body and like have the wind on my face, like walk outside or just do something like that. That just Mm -hmm. feels like you're really changing the subject more than it can feel stupid to just, put a song in your head although it can work like get in your car turn the music up sure, right. it can work right. but you just need to change the subject somehow mm-hmm. and then you're left with this idea that okay so now I feel better I can be more kind of curious instead of like emotionally like aggressive about it. I can be curious about what's going on for me but then like if it's your wife do you really want to bring up that topic when you're feeling better and it's all settled down? Exactly. That's like, the other problem. Like, like, like we're feeling go good now. I don't want to go back there. <laughs> I know. Yes. But that's another thing about having an agreement. Yeah. Because really, it doesn't have to be on date night. when you're. But like yeah. when you really are, if you can just be curious, it's so fascinating. Mm-hmm. If you can give each other the benefit of, like you said this, and I'm guessing you meant this, but I took it like this. Right. If you can, when you can do that, nothing feels better. Right. To right. get that validation from the other person, because you're telling them that you actually got what they were trying to communicate. Yeah. You're actually getting there, and then they can correct and you. Can you. Still they disagree. Can, you're right. They could say, right. "Well, no, actually, what I meant was right. this," and and then then you can explain, "Well, this is how I took it." Yes. And then they're like, "Oh." Oh, that makes sense. I'd be mad about that That's too. That's the thing. If you can get to that, it's. I mean, and it all starts with finding. You can always find one thing to validate about the other person, like about that. You can. We were in therapy. Uh, we were. In, I don't know if my wife would want me. Well, whatever. 
Uh, I share about a lot of things that she may or may not want me to share about. We were in a therapy session about two weeks ago, and we went into the session. This is with a therapist who has been one of the instructors at USM. She's mm-hmm. very, she's incredibly heartfelt, but very much in alignment with what we're talking about. And um, but she's also very practical. Mm-hmm. And we were like, you remember the movie The War of the Roses? Yes. We were like The War of the Roses going into that room. Mm-hmm. I mean, we energetically we were throwing things at each other's heads. I mean, we, <laughs> and it was funny. Like. After about 10 minutes of talking, she was like, okay, guys, time out. You go to your corner. You go to your corner. Time out. If we're done here. And by the time we were done with a session, like, because she asked us that question. Okay, well, what's one thing you could acknowledge in the other one? And like, we were both at losses. Mm-hmm. <laughs> like, we couldn't think of anything. I mean, it was pathetic, mm-hmm. you know? And um, by the time we were done, we we're in a completely different place. Like it, it took about an hour and a half and we were in a completely, I, I, I won't say we were like newlyweds, right? but um, it was so valuable to have that person to stop us. I mean, and in spite of all the training I've done, my wife doesn't engage at the same level that, that I do in this stuff, which is fine. Like it, usually there's one person mm-hmm. that does more than the other one. Um, but I'm, I still sometimes suck at it. You of know? course. And, and having, that, having that help, um, like the reset person, the referee, yep. you know, God, it was so helpful. It and is so helpful. I mean, I remember when I had my husband go to couples counseling under the guise that we had to do it for graduate, that I had to do it for graduate school, which was oh, kind nice. of true, except for it didn't have to be <laughs> Does he know that now? (laughs) No, he does, of course, because then he loved it. He thought it was the greatest thing ever. He's like, oh my God, I can say whatever I want and I'm not going to get in trouble. Right. I'm like, I'm not sure that's really the point. (laughs) Oh, yeah, it is. is. (laughs) Um, Wait, but I forgot what I was going to say about that before we were laughing. Um, What what did you say? I said having the referee. Oh, because that was the kind that we went to was the guy literally was just a referee. He didn't care what the content was. He just wanted you to practice his kind of five steps. I think there were of engagement Mm -hmm. and that's all he did for was to teach us and stop us and make us do it over. And it could be a tiny little thing or the biggest thing we had in the marriage. That sounds cool, but it was really cool. But it's just like what you're saying Uh It's like, you have that person there. It's like, hold on. You're going to start this. You're not going to speak this whole time. Right. You're going to start off with one validation and then you're going to talk only from your side of the equation and you're going to talk about how it feels. You're not going to say you, you know, I mean, there are rules of engagement that we used to use a uh, little heart shaped pillow Mm -hmm. to like the person that was holding the pillow was the one that could talk and you weren't allowed to interrupt. Mm -hmm. We've, we've fallen out of that. We we should bring that back. (laughs) That was a really good practice. It was a really good, we actually learned that from a, a weekend program we did for couples at USM mm-hmm. that was uh, where we learned this technique of talking to one another and giving each other the respect of having the having the pillow and then actually having to repeat back what they said. Yes. Because very often That's the we're, thing. we're interpreting as they talk and we're not even actually hearing what they're saying. No, because you get your point that you're going to jump on yep. and you shut them down because you got to remember what you're going to say exactly, at that point. Exactly, right. And you got that yeah. story going in your head. and Yeah. Yeah, no, right. It's... um. Yeah, it's uh, it's really powerful when you start to listen. Yeah, you know, it's uh, really, really powerful. Yeah, so there's that whole level what goes on between the couple, and then there's that deeper level of looking at your own triggers, right? Which doesn't you don't even need to be in couples counseling for that. Right. You know, that's a different thing. It's like what is it about those things that really get you going? Because you're judging yourself somewhere. In well, there. that's why I said, when you said 50-50 and I said, really, there's 50%? Because like what I found is if your spouse is not interested in doing any sort of counseling or therapy or whatever, you can still have a massive impact on the relationship by taking 100% responsibility for your stuff. Oh, totally. And that will shift the other person. It has it's to. amazing how much somebody else can change by doing nothing yep. simply because you've changed. Because I think that we... We bring out in people, like we meet people at like a certain level on the kind of like emotional hierarchy, right? So like if you're kind of down here in insecurity or anger or whatever it is, you're going to meet the equivalent of that. I mean, it may look different. It may be like look weirdly complimentary, but it's still you're meeting that person from down here. But if you choose to meet any person in your life from a different level, Mm -hmm you're going to bring out a different side of them. You're right. interacting with a whole different piece 
piece of them. Right. Which is why you can have, you know, don't you have people in your life who you have a mutual friend, but those two people don't get along at all? Or what, what, like, I, I can love this th- person because I interact with this part of them, right. but my friend right. who I also love doesn't get that part of them. They yep. interact yep. like a whole, and it's so weird. I'm like, how can you, I love you both, but you guys don't like each other? That's weird to me. Right. But that's what it is. Yep. Yeah, because we all have those. Like I have, sadly, I have that part that would rage at my young child who I loved. It's in there. Like I hate that, but right. most, I don't even see it anymore. But we all, but, but we know. all, we all have that, right? You know, like, and and I think owning all of our stuff means owning the good stuff and owning the bad yeah. stuff, and we all have the bad stuff. I mean, mm-hmm. hey, good and bad. It's we all have the stuff that's that we're not proud of, that yeah. we that we don't want to acknowledge that are our that's ours. Oh, it's them. It's right. A, it's, it's a, that's what I mean. That tractor beam is so strong. How much somebody or something else is to blame for the way you're feeling like that? Because is it the, would just be so much easier if it so was them. <laughs> you could just get rid of them. When I, when I was in therapy in that first ten minutes, there was no convincing me that there was anything other than her, her, her. her. Right. <laughs> I mean, it was insane because I know better. I actually know really know better. I've spent years studying it, and I was still fixed in. You know, the therapist said to me, come, Andy, come on, you, you know, you know, this is there. You're, you're culpable here in, in, in some way you got to figure out how it is. I'm like, I can't, there's no way. Uh, uh-uh, uh, no. <laughs> but then you did. <laughs> then we did. Yeah, we did. It, it took, it took a little bit of effort. But, but see, yeah. that's the cool thing. I think, um, I'm definitely, I think some couples shouldn't stay together. I, I don't believe that every marriage is the right thing, mm-hmm. whatever, but don't leave before you figure out your side of it. Well, what happens if you do? I mean, Then what, you're just going to find the next fine. person to give you the same thing you didn't get out of that other one. You're right, going to do the right. same thing. So because there's something for each of us in those. It's like a, it is like a mirror. It's holding up something that we need to know about ourself. Mm-hmm. If it's not working, then what, like, what, what do we want to do? And then when you figure that out, then maybe that, maybe that relationship, that's what that relationship was for you. Sure, right. And you can part right. in like gratitude, strangely. Yep. Like yep. we did this for each other and now we're going to move on to other things. But people leave before they get that. They leave in the blaming stage. Let's take another quick break and we'll be right back. You've heard me say this before and I'm going to say it again. The podcast lives and breathes based on word of mouth. And uh, anything you do to share what you're listening to, uh, helps to get the message out, helps to get the me- these incredible stories from our guests, these, these incredible levels of expertise out from our guests. Uh, it helps to get them out in the world. And really, that's why I do the podcast, because it's this stuff is too good to not share. So do me a favor. Do your friends a favor. If you hear something in a podcast that you really like, forward them a link to that podcast. You don't even have to have them subscribe. Uh, they will if they like it, hopefully. And um, if you really, really are into it and really, you know, I'd love you to re- write a review for the podcast. It's simple. You can go to bit.ly, B-I-T dot L-Y forward slash Andy Petronic podcast. It'll open up the podcast in iTunes or your computer. And that's where you can leave a review. And um, thanks in advance for either of those. And now let's get back to the show. So tell me about your, tell me the rest of the story. Because I don't think we ever got to the rest of the story. We were you were still in Colorado. You were you were working with cancer patients. You came up with seven pillars. Yes, and then we met the director of the Duke Cancer Center. He just was coming through because everyone comes through Aspen for you know conferences and things. Mm -hmm. And he said, "Are you guys interested in studying this thing that you're doing quantitatively, like literally, like a drug study, like a pill?" Because we had developed a curriculum of discrete interventions. So instead of just having to study that amorphous mystery that happens between two people in mm-hmm. counseling in a room, we could actually know this was the skill, this was the tool we were teaching at any given time. And so we did our first study um, in the Duke Cancer Center with women with metastatic breast cancer. And back then it was a counseling model. So it was a one-on-one counseling model. And we were teaching people kind of two basic sets of skills. There was cognitive behavioral stuff, really thinking like solution focused thinking. How can you, um, when you become aware of the thoughts that drive your behavior, how can you find what's in your control and an action step to actually take Mm -hmm. instead of just getting stuck in the story of the problem. So there was that side of it, helping people think better 
But then there was the mind body skills side of it. So I just always say like, your mind is not always your friend. Thinking is not always your best tool. Even if you're like you said, even if you've done a lot of work and you've cleaned up a lot of your faulty beliefs and all that, it's just thinking just doesn't always serve you, yep. especially yep. when you're feeling emotional. And so and it doesn't always calm you down either. It can be a long if you had to think your way to feeling better, that could take years actually <laughs> <laughs> take your life and you may never get there so there's got to be a better way and so yeah. that better way is with things like guided visualization meditation um which which i always say there's a deep pool of inner peace and inner wisdom inside of us all whether we know it or not and it's always there and i think guided visualization is the easiest form of meditation so you don't have to do anything except for just sit back and listen and mm-hmm. for us we do like beautiful piano music and then just you know a voice that su- takes you on your journey so there's that for the inner peace part but there's also inner wisdom in there which it's for me it's like your gut feeling like we can feel in our bodies what's really true we just tend to ignore it a lot of the time and as a matter of fact we're trained i think as children to ignore it. i mean you're trained to like be deferential to adult, adults be nice to the babysitter listen to your coach and a lot of times there's some red flags going off and you're just like don't cause trouble yeah we don't really teach kids to use intuition to and to feel in your body like you can feel whether someone feels safe and i don't mean safe like they're a horrible person, but I mean like a friend, like you mm-hmm. can, your peers, oh, this person feels safe. It's this a person skill. feels, you write, it's you a learn. skill, but we yeah. all, it's, does, it's not even hard. It's just, we learn that it's not important. Right. And right. I think that's the thing. And so there are ways that you can access your inner wisdom. I mean, intentionally, you could literally close your eyes right now and take a deep breath and just ask what you know and you know. Mm-hmm. But for people who haven't done any of that, there's some cool things you can do. So you can use things that intentionally circumvent your thinking mind. Free association. Freud did it. I'm not what a is huge free association? Freud making you say the first thing that comes to mind. Oh, got Before it. Yeah. you like censor and edit and whatever yourself. Just that, that's so you your say most. microphone and I say pink. Yes, but more, it's more it's like, what do you need right now? Like what's the one thing that would change your life the most if, if you could find a way to get it met? Ice cream. Okay, so. There you go. <laughs> <laughs> I was worried about what answer I was going to get. <laughs> So whether or not that's your most profound answer, it's your most revealing. That's the thing for people because... So I'm shallow. (laughs) Or just hungry. (laughs) And a sugar addict. (laughs) Exactly. Exactly. But there's people, again, like it's the editing process that, Mm -hmm. that becomes interesting. It's like, why don't you say what you really want? Because I don't believe I can get it or because someone's going to think it's not the right thing to want. or cause, So that's where the beauty of that comes in. Mm-hmm. And then free association, just answering, just like making yourself. There's a couple ways to do it. You know, one, you can just write for three minutes. But I think it's more interesting to have a conversation. So, for example, you can have a conversation with your anger. So you on the page, you're going to put, you know, anger me, anger me, anger me. And you're going to give yourself three minutes. And it's point by point at a time. And you don't stop and you don't Is think. Is it like an interview? It's like you're writing both sides of the equation. So your anger is like, I really hate her right now. Oh, really? This is the dumbest exercise I've ever done in my life. I don't even like this therapist at all. But yeah, you can be mad at her too, but whatever. And then you you just keep going. Like you don't, and you get through the stupid silliness of it. Yep. And it's always like around minute three. And like, well, what are you what are you trying to tell me? Like, what do you what do you really want me to know, anger? Since I'm having this stupid conversation with you anyway. Big stuff. Like mm. it's so when you when you take away the sensor, like mm-hmm. the editor up there who's like telling you like who's what you're supposed to think them. and all that, yeah. and you just yeah. get it out. Yeah. There's so much there. Or you can have a conversation with your body or a part of your body or someone who's not there. It's just such a powerful thing to do to just let it flow and it's so simple and it's right here but nobody nobody's trained to do that right and the same thing comes with forcing yourself to use images instead of words so you take out a piece of paper and you're going to draw yourself right now draw yourself in your life right now and draw yourself in your life you know how you want to be if you could have it happen and you have a certain amount of time. That's and you, confronting. Like I just thought of that because I'm not an artist. It, well, because I'm a horrible artist. But, you got, <laughs> but right. nobody's going to see this but you. Like I doodle. But, I, I can do squares and circles to, and shapes. You can and, do that. Like that's the thing is like you can find yourself doing abstract whatever it is. But uh, it will, it gets to a different, because you don't know how to sense yourself really. Like you're not thinking. You're just yeah, like right. putting out. So you're, it's like this part of my life's working not at all. And this part, like it just. And you're, but you're drawing it. But you're drawing it. And right. what's cool is that you get a totally different perspective on your life when you look at it because like there are no coincidences right but you didn't even realize you were like i had i remember 
we were doing this lifeline thing. It was actually at Harvard too. They have really good trainings there. <laughs> we were doing what this a thing surprise, where you, Harvard? <laughs> shocking. <laughs> where you do this um we used images to kind of talk about the turning points in your life and I remember when I when I was doing it, like I knew this thing was like a kind of a dark time for me, but I, I didn't really realize its impact. But when I stood back and looked at the whole thing, it was like, oh, I need to do something about this. Like I need to actually address this because it's I never talk about it. I never think about it. I didn't think it was that big of a deal. Like it was just years ago. It wasn't that big of a thing. But it, when you see it on paper, it's like there's there's a little there's a thing there for me. Like and it was literally that day I let it go. But it just you just see it differently. Mm-hmm. And these things, I mean, they may or may not matter, but they're there. And they, they like, why not clean it up? Mm-hmm. Like, why not just feel like you're like, you know, I don't have, I don't have those things that are going to trip me up, I don't think, you know, anymore that I'm like afraid to look at. Mm-hmm. So, I don't know. There's just power in those kind of tools sure, where right, you're... Right. Where you're not just, you're cleaning up your thinking, but you're also learning how to tap into your inner wisdom. So at any given moment, you could ask yourself, like, this is what I think I'm going to do, but what would my inner wisdom say? Like, oh, I can feel that. Like, I really want this to be the thing that my inner wisdom wants me to do, but it's not, it's not authentic. Right. Right. And, And that's not so accessible without doing some of this work. Yeah, so so to get back to the story and the evolution of it, which I think you'll find interesting is where it's gotten to. So we did that first study, and we had great results. We had these women who were actually dying, but they perceived their quality of life as improved. So is the is the evaluation of a the effectiveness of a program based on like subjective um, rating scales? So we chose nineteen scales, and so and these are you know validated scales that are used in quantitative research, but they are self-report for the most of them mm-hmm. we had some biometric things and actually. it's a scale like one to ten how yeah, do you feel about this or like how do you all different ones like um you know about quality of life and about you know that we had distress in there and helplessness hopelessness anxiety so right, they're just they're right. they are just questions <clears throat> and it only takes like the anxiety one is um nine questions i think and the depression one is um fewer i don't know six or seven i I, i'm forgetting the numbers in my head but the point is these are the things that a lot of researchers use yeah it doesn't take very many questions Mm -hmm. to get to where we can say we are improving their depression level or statistically significant exactly right so you know to make a long story years kind of short so then we realized that we had something that worked but it wasn't scalable Mm -hmm. so then we decided to make an online version of it and we got lucky enough to get this giant grant from livestrong and we put it in 20 hospitals across the country And the cool thing was that we were bringing people together in these live online groups with one of our instructors who we had trained and with our curriculum that's really structured. So we would know what everyone was doing at three minutes and 30 seconds. We would know what question they were on and what they were doing. And um, I thought it would be good, but I didn't think it would be as good as the original because I'm a therapist. So I just imagine that was the best. The one-on-one is the ultimate pinnacle. You're looking someone in the eye and you can Uh feel their energy. And yeah, and it turned out to be totally wrong across every single benchmark it was more effective to be in these small online groups Hmm. which was fascinating right so we had all these people from all over the country coming together they didn't know each other in groups with an instructor well there's a willingness when you're in a group you learn from everybody else in the group i think that was it i think you you can can, look at you can look at somebody else much easier than you can look at yourself totally be like like, oh my god and someone's willingness to kind of go there you appreciate and then you're willing to be vulnerable wow maybe i could do that too i mean that's what happens in crossfit yeah you see somebody across the gym who's maybe your age maybe not and you suddenly see that they can do 15 push-ups and Mm -hmm. you're like wow really like with a trainer a trainer will purposely never give you something to compare yourself to because it could feel judgmental Mm. like why why would i tell a client who is a new client that they should really be able to do 15 push-ups right yeah it doesn't usually serve that client but if a client happens to be in a class and they happen to see somebody that's their age who's able to do 15 push-ups suddenly they get a little seed planted in their head that is something that an expert wouldn't ever tell them right And they may be like, from that moment forward, it may be their subconscious goal to do 15 push-ups without anybody ever saying anything, simply because they're in a room of people who are able to do it too, or they see it on a, on a board on the, on the gym. I mean, that CrossFit had um, really did a huge service to the training 
business um, in in groupifying coaching, mm-hmm. gr- groupifying tra- personal training. Um, That's interesting that there is so much power in the group, even in that. Yeah, because there definitely was for this kind of work. Yeah, Just, right. You know, for getting people to to take a look and be willing to share and process. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So that research, we it came out clinically significant improvement, and it was. Depression, anxiety, PTSD, self-efficacy, and distress we were looking at. So, I mean, this was big stuff. I mean, and this was not, the second study was any cancer. Mm -hmm. um, And it wasn't necessarily, you know, metastatic like the first one. So, um, you know, these people were at all different stages and all different prognoses. And, um, it you know, it was really helpful. Mm -hmm. But the way we did it back then, you had to show up. For everything happened in that hour online. There was no homework or anything or no prep work. So you had to show up 10 times at 9.30 on Tuesday. For t- I mean, who, even yep. if you don't yep. have cancer, you don't, nobody can fit into, into their lives. Yep. So now we had this thing that's scalable, but like who's going to use it because mm-hmm. it's too hard. So then we made it asynchronous. So we made it so it was videos. So you could watch the videos whenever you wanted mm-hmm. and then choose to come to groups when you wanted, which, which was it worked just as well. But now it's kind of like... Did you have a cohesive group that you were going through with? Or every time you jumped into a group, you were with a different group? So, good question. Because the first way you did, which was a lot of that bonding that happened, even though you didn't know people, then now you don't. Right. And so... I would imagine that doesn't work anymore. It takes away from it, Uh for sure. But, so, because we were thinking, like, is the anonymity more important than that? But no, people like to be in those groups. You're totally right about that. And... Now you're like, oh, I can do it on my own time. Like we talked about before. Like, when do you really want to do that? Like, this never, is like uncomfortable. Never, I, I don't right. Wanna, uh, right. I don't want to talk about my fears. I don't want to. Uh. So, so if it's available anytime, it's also available no time. Which is why I love your whole life challenge. The fact that you only do it certain times a year. So you have to, this is when you're going to do it or you're going to miss it. So yep. I think that's a genius thing that we need to apply. So now where we are is we've had to take it because especially because of my interest in taking this down to high school and college kid level, mm-hmm. I realized that I needed to get it onto your phone. And I needed to get make it so small and mm-hmm. so not burdensome in your life that you could get hooked on this idea of learning these skills with like the swipe of a thumb. Like like Fortnite. Like you know the game for I it? wish. <laughs> oh my god, my middle son. Like fifty million kids it's around the world. Crazy. I'm playing it just because I want to make sure I know what the kids are doing. Well, you can get good and you can make millions of dollars being I, a player. I can't be good. Like it's just. Wh- I mean, the hours that it would take for me to get good at the, that stupid game. I feel like my son puts them in. I'm like, mm-hmm. well, at least get rich. Right. I, <laughs> right. I feel like such a bad mother that right. you play so many video games. <laughs> I've let it go. See, yeah, I can be a bad is. mother. Right. <laughs> I, can, I can live with myself. <laughs> right. <laughs> oh, yeah. That's a whole other thing. But yeah, yeah so we um, now I'm doing a 21 day challenge, which is like 21 days to kind of create some new habits and learn some of these skills so you can get an idea of what we're talking about. So like what we said is like, can you identify the thought behind your emotion? Mm-hmm. And so, you know, you get this little 60 or 90 second podcast that's like day one Mm -hmm. it's gonna be like this is what we're gonna do today it's really important to know that there's a thought causing your emotion and the reason is because you know your emotions can feel like they take over your body but actually when you can identify the thought even when you can't change the situation you can find something to do about it maybe the thought's not true maybe it's kind of true maybe whatever it is and so then we pop into your life a couple times that day just takes 10 seconds it's like what's your emotion you're feeling right now you get like Like a text or a notification or something what emotion are you feeling right now what's the thought behind it boom you learn that skill like maybe there's a video that wraps it up at the end of the day so it's just basically you know 21 simple skills which Mm -hmm. there anyone can grasp them Mm -hmm. but taken together they really give you a different way of being and when you integrated them into your life by having it pop in and having to answer those questions Now you've actually done something different Mm -hmm. and something is going to stick with you. Sure. Like something will. So, and then I feel like we can draw them into the more that we have. But Mm -hmm. my goal has just been trying to figure out how do you get people to want to learn this stuff? Because often it takes your life falling apart. Right. Before you go and learn. And and that was, that was my point about the cancer back then. Like that, you know, everybody needs to go through something major so that they were, they're willing to show up. Yep. And when I, I'm doing the student resilience pilot at Duke, and when I did my first interviews with these kids, I was thinking that um, maybe I should just we should just force them to take like a resilience class, like at the beginning of freshman year, mm-hmm. 
And uh, I mean, the powers that be, I think, would have been into that. I mean, they were curious, like, is this what we need to do? And I already had built the whole online thing. It would have been easy to do that. But I wanted to find out if that was the right thing. And these kids, it was interesting, even just giving them like five minutes of this one tool, they, of course, they only showed up for the interview for the 20 bucks. Let's be clear. Like, they, you know, that's what <laughs> that's right, what they were doing right. there. And then when they got a grasp of what the material was, because again, they don't know what we're talking about here. They were like, oh, this would actually be really helpful. Mm-hmm. But two things, if you make us take it, we're not going to care. Right. We're going to phone it in like we do the alcohol training stuff and the date rape stuff, and we're yep. gonna we're just not going to care. We're going to automatically think it's bad. And then um, you don't even know how hard freshman year is until you're a couple months in. Yeah, right. And right. that's when you feel a little bit lonely and you haven't quite found your people yet, and it's mm-hmm. hard and you feel like an imposter. All those things. So if we knew it was there, but it was our choice we would engage. Sure. So that's that's why I'm kind of on this path to try to find some way to then So if people want to do this now, how do they is there does it live somewhere? Does the program live somewhere? Um, it's interesting. I wonder if I should talk about this. No, um so I seven years ago um had originally I had a nonprofit which I still have in Aspen. Mm-hmm. Um, but I decided that when we needed to build this whole online platform and everything, I needed money. So I decided to start a for-profit company. And so I found some investors and we started this company and it has been a really interesting seven year process Mm. that has actually just come to an end, which is on one hand, um, weird and sad and on another it just it is it just is what it is it's sort of i could tell you i mean i could write a book a million things that we did wrong um from a business trying to create a business out of this Mm -hmm. perspective and i would have even a year ago would have beaten myself up for not knowing how to do that well and now i see the the i mean I don't want to speak for like the investors who money they're not going to get back now, right? Like yeah, right. for me, right. like my per- it just I, we tried. It just it was just really hard to make a business out of this. So for me in my life, I'm um, going back to working with privately with people, mm-hmm. kind of in two had ways. You, had you stopped that? I did stop that, which which really was. Um, I mean, I stand by the decision. We took a lot of people's money, and so I felt real obligation to give a hundred percent of my time to that. Mm-hmm. But um, I'm doing some corporate consulting now, too, and this would be one of the things that I would say is, like, when you move too far from what gives you joy and what's your real core skill set, that's not always a good thing either, Right? you know, to spend seven years in this business side of things and, Mm -hmm. like, away from that was just not a great thing. And so I'm really, I miss that. And I really love, even though I built this group model i really love one-on-one it's mm-hmm. like what makes me tick i just right. love doing that well, there's a big difference between the two there's and- a huge difference and so and i and i spent all these years like building a way to scale and so like we have this you know our professional training program is accredited by all the psychology you know therapists and social workers and all that stuff so i have the way to like do these giant things for big populations and mm-hmm. train people and whatever and and know that everybody's doing the same thing. It's standardized and all that kind of stuff. But my heart <laughs> is in the one-on-one. So I don't know what's going to happen with the company. I mean, we still have the ability to do all this. It's just kind of going to, like, how does it settle out with sure, investors right. and all that stuff? And I, yeah. so I'm not sure. Mm-hmm. But for me, I really want to do one-on-one stuff with people who just for their own lives. But also, I really love going into companies and and looking at what's not working in a culture yeah, right, like and right. like you can have leaders who are really smart and really good at one thing but not necessarily with the emotional intelligence not mm-hmm. necessarily with that management of people and and then even from a that's sort of like a high level leadership and even from like we've we've had a lot of talks with companies about like those entry level employees who no one ever thinks to train because it costs money. Yep. But if you think about needing certain industries where you need your entry level employees to rise, so like in um, retail, for example, like you really need a, a clerk to end up being an assistant manager and then a manager, but they don't have skills. Like they don't have the skills to be able to keep the stuff, the stress from their regular life from coming into their work life, and then like leading like other groups of people and so now you're it's almost like luck 
that that you get the right people. It, in the right it place. is, and the, and yeah. that, and it's hard. I mean, when a company's trying to grow, the turnover in that is yeah, it's right. a lot, and so yeah, right. so that just interests me now. I mean, mm-hmm. again, I love the stuff. Like, I love the high school, college stuff too. So I'm just kind of open. I'm just kind of curious to where the bigger programmatic stuff is going to end up. But just for me, I just want to stay in that one-on-one work. Do you consider what you do? Um, well, the, I was going to say, what I was going to ask is, do you consider what you do more therapy or more coaching? 100% not therapy anymore. I'm a licensed marriage and family therapist. Yeah. But um, actually, in, I'm licensed in Colorado too as a counselor, but I don't like doing that anymore. I just, oh. I mean, that's really about diagnosing and treating. Yeah, and right. I, and that's right. just where my head is. I consider <clears throat> it, I mean, I don't, coaching is probably the word that people recognize. Yeah. So yeah. Like so life, um, life coaching, business coaching. Yeah. So it's, but it's really, for me, it's a little bit different because I have a proven curriculum of skills. Mm-hmm. So I'm going to teach you a set of skills that are quantifiable. You're going to walk out and you're going to know how to do these things. Mm-hmm. And so that's kind of the way I look at it. So it's like consulting, so it's one skills on, training. It's like having a one-on-one teacher of a method. Yep. It, th- I call it the Kristen McDermott method. Oh. That's exactly oh, cool. right. Yeah. So it's yeah. like it'd be like having a sensei who's teaching sensei, you. Sensei, yeah, so I'll take it. That's what I'm going to put on my business McDerm- card. <laughs> <laughs> the McDermott is a little odd with the sensei. Yeah, that's, uh, yeah. You need a you need a like a Zen name. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> sensei K. I like it. <laughs> um, yeah, that's that's really cool. That's really cool. So how? Tell me a little bit about how you go about keeping your life aligned. Um, like, do you have non-negotiables in your day when mm-hmm. you go through your day? Yep. Like, in terms of your health and kind of well-being mm-hmm. and both physical state, mental state, emotional state. Like, what are your what are your non-negotiables that you need to do on a daily basis? I or love that question. More often, mornings. Like more. Like okay. I, I get up at five thirty, and I don't like mornings particularly I mean I wouldn't I'm like I don't love getting up early but but I do because I, that lets me have a little bit of quiet time no one else is awake mm-hmm. I do a little meditation 15 minutes not a lot mm-hmm. little journaling just like it's just I just love that quiet when no one else is awake and then I run my dog I live in the hills oh, cool. we go on a run mm-hmm. the world isn't awake yet and so by the time it's breakfast time at seven to get my kids ready for school I've checked off like five things. Right. I, I feel right. so empowered. I've, I've already accomplished so much. So even when I'm tired, like this morning, I just get up because. Do you set your alarm? Yeah, I, I do. Because I, I mean, because I, I don't. I need to go to bed at like nine to make five thirty work. Yep. Yep. <laughs> but then I get in my bed and I read a book and I don't turn the light out, so that I'm just tired yeah, by right. the end of five right. days of doing that. When do you, you normally know? get to bed? I mean, I it's hilarious. I mean, you might go to bed at nine, but what do you go, when do you normally go to sleep? I guess is a better. I mean, question. it's when I because I I like to read and I just like mm-hmm. to read not anything that's important. I just like to read novels like historical fiction. Mm-hmm. And um, if it's if it's good, I'll read too long. Like I re- like if it's rare that I don't turn the light off before ten. Okay, but I really should turn it off at nine thirty. And but I'll get right. in my bed like eight. I'm really a dork. I'm really kind of a loser. Um, <laughs> I mean, that's when my son goes to bed at eight thirty. So I don't know. I mean, I wouldn't even be able to put my son to bed. Well, my I, daughter goes. She. I mean, my daughter kisses me goodnight now. She'll be like, "Oh, I'll put you to bed, mom. It's okay." Really? <laughs> wow, that's cool. Actually. I know, but I, I mean, I, like I said, I don't. Usually, it's somewhere between nine thirty and ten. Uh huh. Um, yeah, and so then because there's a million reasons not to work out. By the way, if I don't work out in the morning, yep. I can tell you fifty five reasons. So your workout is a run. Basically. So my workout is a run, okay. and I and I just like the hills, like running mm-hmm. on flat. If I lived somewhere flat. It ends up hurting for some reason. Like mm-hmm. run, I like up, I would run uphill both ways if I could. <laughs> right, right. Downhill is much harder. Yeah, March much harder. Your joints much harder. Yeah, because you're you're having to slow down your body each time. You yep. You know you're doubling and tripling the impact from the from gravity. And I so. years ago, not that many years ago, maybe I don't know eight or ten years. No, I'm longer than that now. Anyway, read Born to Run, oh, it's and such it a changed great book. my life because I never could run as my primary form of exercise till I read that book, and now yeah. I run that way, and I'm. About to turn 50. Do you use barefoot and running shoes? I don't do anymore. Like I did, I used those shoes? Newtons for a while. Not barefoot, but mm-hmm. I used the ones that had the lug or whatever you call on the front. The, these are, you know, f- these are basically barefoot shoes. They're made by um, Zero. They're called Zero Shoes. Oh, yeah. I used, I used New Balance Minimus for a long time. And then, um, but these are, the, I really like these. Vivo Barefoot also makes some really, really Well, really you know what's funny? I, I mean, I did right out of the box. I really did that. And now I've actually, 
um, I just have regular shoes now, but I just still run mm-hmm. uh, using the arch, you know, yep. on the back of the ball. Yep. And there's, so I just, I just, something about running, it just feels, I don't know, it's just such a great, feels so good. It's like meditative. It just, How do you keep yourself first thing in the morning from grabbing your phone and doing... The, I just stuff. don't do that. You don't. I just don't. You just have a habit of yeah. That's when do you pick the phone up and start? Not doing till it? when it's t- when I go to wake my kids up, and then the day like really starts o'clock like when, seven. Right. Yeah. All right. And then I'm still like I'm really not available until I'm getting in my car to go to my office. Like I don't right. really do a lot. Oh, you don't work out of your house. No. Well, I actually do right this minute now mm-hmm. that my office. I, I told you that yep. company thing that was literally a week ago, okay. but um, I'm about to get another one. So, and I kind of like being home actually to tell you the truth, but I don't have a good space for it there. Right. And I like the, I like getting up and leaving. Uh-huh. I mean, it's interesting though, to be home now for the last week and it's not so bad having everything right there. It's different. <laughs> it's, I've had to get yeah. used to it cause I work out of my house. I used to go to the office. I used to have an electric bike that I would commute to. And I really liked that. But I also, th- and sometimes it's hard. Sometimes I have to generate the energy to not get distracted by all the other things that are around my yeah. house it's but, more, and like the refrigerator calls absolutely. like i don't snack at all at my office but I'm like, right um i'm not even hungry i'm just bored right let's go see what's in the pantry right totally <laughs> that's another thing i do for self-care though is i am a vegetarian like i'm just super a super healthy eater and that okay. just feels that's a non-negotiable for me so when you say vegetarian do you eat fish do you eat i, eggs? I mean do i you? rarely eat fish i used okay. to be a pescatarian but i um but i will go to sushi every once in a while with my husband um and i but i do eat eggs yeah okay and um i eat some like i eat parmesan cheese i don't eat much cheese but i eat, i don't not much dairy but a little bit so but it's mostly, not for me it's mostly just an, fruit and veggies or like, yeah Okay, and cool. and grains like I'm not paleo. I'm I'm grains. I'm the yep. opposite of you know opposite of paleo. Yeah. Do you eat a lot of fat? Yeah, I eat like a lot almond butter, avocados, mm-hmm. olive oil. I eat a lot cool. of fat. Cool. Yeah. Um, that was probably the biggest thing that I did stupidly in my twenties. Like I would exercise all, all the, the time and get rid of. We were all supposed to get rid of all the fat, I and know, then you're eating all these stupid empty carbs. Yep. So dumb. I agree. <laughs> There's still people that do it. You know, but I, you know, I agree. Yeah. Um, so wait, so, okay. So your non-negotiables go, negotiables in the morning are meditation, mm-hmm. journaling. Do you have any technique that you use for journaling or do you just write um, stream I, of consciousness? Yeah, or? I actually decided a few years ago that, but I, journaling has served me so well. So back when I had stuff that I needed to figure out, my journals would be working through that. So there would, they would be a lot of negative because I had to get yeah, some of right. that out. But right. I decided that my mine are positive. Like I don't journal negative anymore, but that's mm-hmm. not, that's just because, I don't know, I just, it's just a choice I made. So I use my journal as a, either a kind of vision thing or as a, an asking my inner wisdom or spirit, like to find my answers for myself so you would like let's so let's just talk about a journal entry you put today's date yeah now do you do you ask yourself a question so to get yourself going like, like do I, you? I know this is gonna sound weird but i uh, we do this actually in the curriculum where we do these letters to and from spirit so spirit is one of the seven pillars yep and it doesn't matter to me what spirit means to you and it can even mean you don't even have to believe in god it can even be your inner wisdom so you could write this letter to your inner wisdom but mm-hmm. It just stuck with me. So a lot of mornings I will ask a question and write as if I'm spirit answering. Oh, cool. So in the letters that we do, you write one to spirit saying like, this is, I don't know what to do about this or this is my intention, or whatever. So you're you talking to spirit, but then spirit answers. Oh. And for me to just like, just put myself in that frame of mind, because whether it's spirit or your inner wisdom, you, we do know our answers. At, at University of Santa Monica, they called that your inner counselor. Same thing. And you would, yes. you would ask your inner counselor a question and mm-hmm. the, the wisdom. I remember it. And you know what? I stopped doing it right as I stopped doing you know, University of Santa Monica. And um, in, in you just talking about it, I remember now the deep compassion and loving and wisdom and yep. that, that voice. And it was amazing because I used to just think it was the most ridiculous exercise. It sounds like it. It sounds yeah. ridiculous. Yeah. Like, how would suddenly I be able to write something different than I would just think right now? But you, you do. do. That's Every what's time so weird. It's, it's weird. And it's not it's even hokey. Weird. And that's the thing right. that's so strange is that otherwise, if we don't do that, we walk around our lives never hearing that voice. Right, right. And so we just live in the critical and the negative and the not quite living up and the... 
Because your inner, your inner counselor or your spirit, I mean, my experience was I could do no wrong. There was no, right. there was no wrong. Right. My, my spirit is never right. in judgment of me. Right. It's a whole different thing. It's like it's like this embracing, you know, energy that just loves you no matter who you are and yeah. no matter what you've done. Yeah. And no matter what you want for yourself. It's like I think I think not knowing what you want for yourself at a given time in your life is almost the worst feeling that there is. Mm-hmm. And because it just feels lost. Mm-hmm. And, uh, but I mean, you can, we can be trained to think, is that selfish? Like, what do you mean you, want? you should serve? And I get all that. But like, really, when you don't know what your next step is or what you should be, I, I don't know, I, I'm, I'm, I'm really driven. Maybe it's weird, but I, just, I always have this thing inside of me that once I want to be working towards something and moving towards something. Mm-hmm. So not knowing what that is feels so bad bad are you feeling that now no i'm like, not the but there, there was a time like okay. if this had happened a year ago with the company i wasn't ready yeah i yep. just wasn't ready mm-hmm. and i think that's the power of listening to that spirit or inner wisdom is that there is no right answer you get to f- you get go to, to the joy yeah, like right, just just right. go there go right. to where your strengths are and what you already want to do but like there's a million reasons why you don't want to say it out loud that's what I get from that is like you it's okay like whatever you want to do right now it's okay so do you have a hard time coming up with it what that what is that question in the morning in your writing like, um I mean I guess sometimes more than others you know sometimes I'll I'll I don't have like a burning question mm-hmm. and so I have like certain books that I like to read that are just like little chapter things that just get me thinking oh yeah um like a one page yeah parable or something exactly so that'll just like which is kind of fun because then it's like oh that so applies to my life right now and you just turn to the page like you didn't yeah 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 oh cool cool so meditation journaling um take your dog for a run yep anything else in that hour and a half um not in that hour and a half but um then i would say if you go through the rest of the day i really like family dinner Oh, cool. I mean, I like to cook. Mm-hmm. Just, it just makes me feel like I'm... Are your kids vegetarian too? No. <laughs> no, my kids and my husband are regular old American okay. meat eating. So I cook... Are they paleo? Do they, no. Do they pay attention to their diet? Yeah, they, they pay attention because they have me for a mom. And right. my, my thing is not like... It's not like some a moral thing that I do. It's just feels better to me. Like sure, I just right. play, I feel I have more energy. It just feels better to my body. Uh-huh. And so I'm always getting them to like be aware, mindful, like what feels good to you. So you're not your fridge isn't full of sodas and No, but I uh, but my husband buy I mean there are Oreos in my house. There's a <laughs> lot of things in my house that I would not buy. But he yeah, right, goes to right. Ralph's and buys the thing. So yeah, my my son eats a ton of chocolate chip cookies, those Ralph's chocolate chip cookies, those I have little such a hard time with <sighs> that. Like um because my son does my son doesn't eat a ton of them, but he they definitely are around our house Mm -hmm. and my wife is definitely more connected to treats and sugar and the there's a love connection i think that Mm -hmm. she's got between sugar and like love yeah that that she probably you know grew up with and uh so there's more of it than i would have if it were my house and i i have this really weird thing where i typically don't go out and buy it but I'll eat it. That's funny. If it's in the house, like <laughs> I won't no go to... there's no calories if you didn't buy it. <laughs> exactly, right. It doesn't count. It's almost right. like it doesn't... It's this right. weird thing. Like, I won't go to Ralph's and buy a box of things. I won't even go to Trader Joe's. And like, I love those little chocolate almonds at Trader Joe's. Mm-hmm. I had a weakness... Oh, those are so good. I had a weakness last week. We we stopped at Trader Joe's to get... Um, oh, we were coming back from soccer practice. And there's one of those new... Um, taco guys that's that's opened up a stand outside the parking lot of trader joe's so mm-hmm. we stopped to get dinner at the taco guy this isn't the healthiest <laughs> <laughs> solution um and we had to get something there was some reason we had to go into trader joe's and i'm like i was starving and there were those chocolate almonds right on the end cap as i was checking out i'm like give me those <laughs> see i, I can't have those in, like, in my house I fi- no i can't well i yeah. can't either i finished them in two days yeah no that's gone bad. yeah so but it didn't count strangely <laughs> But I did buy them. <laughs> but that, you bought them. I almost never buy them. Yeah. So it's fun. It's a strange thing. So yeah. I relate to that. Yep. Um, so, uh, okay. So then what else are non-negotiables? Do you have an evening routine? Do you have any? I mean, just my, re- it's just reading. Like there's yeah. something about reading that's, you know, not TV does not put me to sleep. I don't want to huh. watch TV. Huh. 
to go to sleep. Right. My husband would have the TV on all the time, but yeah. he grew up an only child and it was like company for him. Like, Do you I, keep the TV in the bedroom? There is a TV in the bedroom, yeah, but I just don't like it. We like I race him up there because if I get to the bedroom first, then, then no there's TV. no TV. <laughs> That's why I go to bed so early so I can get in the bed and it's mine. That's funny. Yeah. <laughs> Although I will tell you, lately I've been binge watching Billions. <laughs> I love that show. <laughs> because I someone was asking show. me, they were like, oh, you want to be like her, don't you? I'm like, no, 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 no. I'm Now that I've seen her, like I think yeah, it's right. really interesting. <laughs> yeah. No, no. You got to have like some morals. <laughs> right, totally. <laughs> I don't want to be writing my wisdom <laughs> for... Yeah, I get I get locked into shows like I'm I'm watching The Leftovers right now, which is an HBO show. I don't that, know that one. Um, I don't know if you if you want suggestions because you'll start binge watching too. <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, yeah, but Billions and I like I like Homeland. Yeah, yeah Michael loves that one. I, I haven't watched it. Um, but I somehow I won the yeah, won the war about the TV in the bedroom. Somehow I got you know we don't have a tv in the bedroom my wife really wants a tv in the bedroom yeah. I'm like look you want to watch the today show put it on your computer like it, it's actually right. you can stream it live on your computer so um somehow i've won that that's impressive but, yeah it's good yeah that's good. yeah but, so that's i mean i think those are all the things i um i don't know we have good kids and i i just like my time with them they're spread out in age so yeah. i just try to we we pretty much do kid stuff on the weekends, which is, I think there was a time when I would have resisted yeah, the me too, me too. club sports because it's so much time it takes us to realize, And we're like, we're, what else do we have to do? I, say, I feel the same way. We say that all the time. <laughs> what else do we got to do? I, I mean, mean, this is great. It gives we're us a social life. We're hanging out outside. We're relating to all these other parents. Yeah. We're, we're going to the baseball games or we're mm-hmm. I'm coaching the baseball yeah. games. You know, it's super fun. It and, is. Um, yeah, I think I agree. I mean, I was an older parent. My son was born when both my wife and I were 40. Mm-hmm. And uh, I was ready. Yeah. You know, like if I had been 25, I would have yeah. been resenting, yeah. like hanging out at the ball game. I want to go out and be snowboarding or yeah. you know, whatever it is. And then they're gone. I know. And then they're then gone. they grow up. Um, so what was I? I was just going to ask you something and it just blew out of my head. Non-negotiables? No. No, well, you kind of covered those. Oh, how do you and your husband use the tools and the skills that you are such a professional at teaching? Do, is there is it is it difficult with your husband to use the skills of your profession in your relationship? Yeah, I mean, I think he would have said in those years. Well, I don't know. I don't know what what is the answer to that. I mean. I guess it's kind of like I go back to skiing. Like, do you do you snow ski or you said you snowboard? Both. Snowboard. Like, and I don't ski. think yeah. you should teach your spouse that. <laughs> like, that's a recipe for well, divorce. Right? I can't. I can't teach my wife anything in the gym. Like, so we that's tried. The thing. We tried doing training yeah. together, and that does not. And work. I think the same goes for this. Like, you mm-hmm. can't therapize your own husband so or you guys spouse. Have ther- but my husband is um, is an amazing person. So ever since that time when I told him he had to go to couples counseling for graduate school, uh-huh. and he loved it. He really saw the value in therapy. Like he just loved it. And he knew he had some stuff of his own that he needed to work on. And he went and did his own work. And he really was a seeker and did, which was a 180 degree turn from where he was. And he is one of those people who has gone on his own journey and walked himself from a place of not being conscious to having the same conversations as I do, like the same wow. spirituality, wow. the same way of thinking. It's, it's a remarkable thing mm-hmm. because there were, and I would say this in front of him, I mean, there were times when, when I was on my journey of learning this before he was, when it was kind of like I had what not to do right in front of me. Like, I mean, he, and, and that's awful. And mm-hmm. you can't, but you can't help someone unless they want to help themselves. Right. And somewhere along the way, I think he, he just... He got the message. Like he, he, he. Re- I think he realized there was a time in our relatively early. I mean, we, like I said, we've been married forever. We've been married for almost twenty six years. Mm-hmm. That he was going to lose me. We were going to just. We were had gotten to a point where it just wasn't going to happen. And he chose instead of being angry and blaming, he chose to sit and look at his side of things. Right. And from that moment on, he was willing to do it. That's amazing. It's amazing. Yeah, There's a lot of people out there listening, going, "God, I'm jealous." <laughs> no, it's <laughs> really a man. There are only a few people in my life who I have watched walk from so far on the kind of angry victim mm-hmm. thing to 
all the way to the other side, like through the shame, through the everything. And again, the only reason I can say that is because he would be okay because he's, it's like an amazing thing to watch someone do. But he had to do that for himself. And it wasn't me. Like, I'd love to take credit, Mm -hmm. but it wasn't. He found his own things that worked for him. You put it in front of him just because there was no choice. You were going through it yourself and it suddenly was there. And then I'm a good sounding board because then when he wanted to talk about it, then I just like the greatest thing ever to have him want to talk about that stuff. And is he in that... I mean, given your what you just said about billions, is he in that business? Is he in the financial? No, he's um, in the real estate business. Oh, wow. So, yeah. Wow. Yeah, but he's had to, you know, he was originally wanted to be an actor, and that was like a heartbreaking thing to have to give up that dream. And then, you know, the movie businesses can be hard if you don't oh, God. make it. Even if you do make or it. Or even if you do make it. Right. Exactly. I mean, how, yeah. many, how many actors are, you know... Strug- super famous actors right. are still effed up, you know? Yeah, and have to keep re- reinventing yourself and all that. And, yeah. Um, yeah, he's amazing. Well, thank you so much. You know, I really appreciate uh, having met you. Um, and I really appreciate your candor and openness and your willingness to share kind of everything you're going through. Like it's, I, you know, the, the, the rawness of this new cha- shift in your life and this change. Um, and all the great things you've accomplished with your resili- resiliency project. Um, I uh, Well, and wait, you haven't talked about your books that are coming out, right? Oh, yeah. So I'm, I am really excited about that. So um, originally, we wrote a book that Jocelyn helped me with that mm-hmm. was, I mean, it was always going to be about resilience, but this, we just it kind of ended up being kind of like, I don't know what the right word is, kind of deep in the weeds, because that's where I like to go. So it was like really about if you're really interested Mm -hmm. in knowing how to work your mindset about a particular issue, and how to apply a skill to a particular, uh, like, um, not strategy, but challenge. Mm -hmm. So we we took things like divorce, um, like raising teens, parenting. So we took particularly challenging issues and applied these resiliency skills to them. And so, I mean, I, I actually am really excited about the book, but I think it ends up being more for someone who is in my line of work and yep. maybe as helpful when you're working with people. So then we had this idea of... Now, that book's not out yet. That's not out yet. Okay. So then we decided, to, instead of coming out with that one first, to, to, to actually create a coffee table book around resilience. So you take beautiful and inspiring and provocative images, and you can open to any page, and there's a few paragraphs that are you can read them in a minute you know 60 seconds that are actually a skill that you can apply to your life like we talked about a few of them like feel people out right Mm -hmm. like Mm -hmm. pay attention to how you feel around certain people and like simple but when you apply it to your life you realize like wow i'm like letting people in my life who really like this person just sucks the life out of me why do i why do right. I make that choice every day? Right. And so, you know, they're they're simple and easy, but they're you can get something. If you're sitting at someone's table and you pick up this coffee table book, you can and it'll start a good conversation at dinner. Like, mm-hmm. wow, I thought about this. And so we're gonna come out with that first. So that one's just being finalized and we're gonna come out with that first and then oh, cool. you know, hopefully the other one after that. But cool. What what will that be called? I don't know yet. Interesting. <laughs> I don't know it's pretty, yet. It's fresh. Yeah, it's really fresh. And the name, interestingly, is... Um, it's hard, right? It's hard. Because Michael, really Mike, Michael and I are in the process of writing a book. We've been in the process for re- of writing a book for about... God, I hate to think. I think maybe two years. <laughs> yeah. We don't have a title. We don't, we're still working on it. It's changed shape a mm-hmm. bunch of times. It does. And uh, it's, it's especially hard because there are two of us trying mm-hmm. to write the book. And um, and did you have anyone else helping you besides just the two of you? Well, yeah. I mean, we we went down the route of talking to Josh. Well, we talked to Jocelyn. Yeah. She was one of the people we talked to. And then we decided that uh, because we're both somewhat difficult, <laughs> <laughs> somewhat opinionated, uh, that it'd be better. There was a company called Book in a Box mm-hmm. that we decided to go with. And we, we are with them. And we're still figuring it out. You know, it's, it's anything but linear. We yeah. thought the book was going to be one thing. It has comp- it is completely different than what we thought we were going to, we were starting with. So we've, we're having to kind of go back to not square one, but go back to, um, I think we're, we're kind of going back to the square one, but it'll be a quicker Journey, I get it. That's what know? happens. You just don't you yeah. don't even know you don't know what you don't know. And I you know, I guess to go back to something we said earlier in the thing, um take an action. Mm-hmm. You can always 
you can always change. Yeah. You can always shift, change course. But if, if you don't ever start, yeah. you, don't, you won't get there. Especially with something like a book because it's so daunting. Yeah. And then you get, then you get it. And like the fir- with the first thing we wrote, it's like, oh, Jocelyn and I love it. And I really, and there's some people love it. But then some people are like, I mean, this isn't that interesting for people who aren't like living in this world all the time. I'm like, yeah. I get that. Yeah. I can yeah. see that. But, and then it brought this idea that I really love for this coffee right. table book. I'm right. like, wow. We got to do that. What a cool thing. And yeah. so, yeah, you just got to be open and do it. Well, best of luck with both well, of those. I can't wait to hear about them and promote them and read them. Thank and you. Put yeah. one on my copy. You know, that you would know. be that might be a good uh, good one for inspiration for the journaling. You read one of the pages of the book. <gasps> Such and- a good idea. <laughs> I love that. You don't know what to write about? Read a page of the book. Right. Yeah, that's good. So, last but not least, how do people get a hold of you? How do people do you engage in social media? Are you on Twitter, Instagram? Like, where do we where do we find you? Yes. Yeah, so, um, Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter. Although I don't, I do Twitter, but I don't really have followers on Twitter. I was just told to just put stuff there too. Yeah, so right, I don't, you know. Right. But for both Facebook and Twitter, it's at Kristen McD MFT. Is it M C D? No, M A C. So Kristen K R I S T I N M A C D M F T. That's for Twitter and, and Facebook. Facebook, and then Instagram is Kristen McDermott. So okay. it's M A C D E R M O T T. Yeah, and all all that will go in the show notes. So if you okay. if you're confused and you don't remember, you know, you're in your car or whatever, you can go to wholelifechallenge.com forward slash podcast, and you'll see, um, you can get the show notes. Great. Right. Thank you. Thanks again. <laughs> Signing off. Hey, it's Andy, and thanks so much for listening. If you want to know more about what I'm learning each month, head over to andypetronic.com and subscribe to my monthly newsletter. If you were touched, moved, or inspired by anything you heard today, chances are someone else you know would be too. Please take a moment to think about who and send them a link to this episode. And if you're super stoked, please head over to iTunes to write a review. The best way to keep current on guests and episodes is to subscribe so that the latest one will automatically get delivered straight to your phone. The apps I use for this are Apple Podcasts, Overcast, or Pocket Casts. The Andy Petronic Podcast is produced by our team, Winslow Jenkins, Becca Borowski, and Ernie Hurtado. Big thanks to Nikki Grudadaria for the artwork. You can find all of our episodes, links, and complete show notes at wholelifechallenge.com forward slash podcast. I'm Andy Petronic. Thanks for listening.